Para selecionar seu idioma, basta clicar no ícone do globo na barra inferior do zoom e selecionar sua preferência. To select your language, just click on the global icon in the zoom bottom bar and make your selection. Para selecionar seu idioma, só haga clique no ícone do globo em la parte inferior de zoom e haga a seleção. Olá, uma vez mais. Hello and once again, good morning. Good morning, everyone. I'm Valeska Sere. I'm the head of Seafood Show Latin America, the first seafood trade show for Latin America, organized by Franco Feiras and Seafood Brazil. We are very honored with this partnership with Alaska Seafood Marketing Institute, ASMI. This is the first event we are holding 2021 for the Seafood Show Latin America scheduled to take place between the 26th and 28th of October 2021 in Sao Paulo, Brazil. During this three hour program, we are providing simultaneous interpretation into Spanish, Portuguese and English with a short break. I can see you sending us messages. Welcome all of you. Thank you for joining us today. And I see we have participants from different parts of the world. So let's start with Mr. Jose Madeira, CEO and founder of River Global that represents Alaska Seafood Marketing Institute in Latin America. Good morning, Jose Madeira. Good morning, Valeska. Thank you very much for your introduction. Hello, everyone. I'm Jose Madeira. I am the CEO and founder of Global River. We represent the Seafood Institute, Marketing Institute. On behalf of ASME, we thank Seafood Show Latin America for this partnership in putting this event together the Alaska Seafood Global Tour. I'd like to thank our speakers and our audience from different countries such as Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Mexico, among others. And our partners who have joined us today. Special thanks to the Alaska Seafood Industry and the USDA Foreign Agriculture Services in DC and their offices in Latin America. Together, our partners have worked hard in order to bring you this opportunity to discuss new strategies to foster business on the global seafood marketing starting with a wild, natural, and sustainable raw material from Alaska, our guests will share their success cases in innovation, competitiveness, and profitability in the global seafood market. And to welcome you all, we have invited Hannah Lindoff, Senior Director of Global Strategy Marketing for the Alaska Seafood Marketing Institute, ASME, based in Juneau, the capital of Alaska. Because of the time difference, time zone difference, she sent us a pre recorded messages. We will share her video and it's in English. I wish you all a very fruitful event. And I hope that it helps you to foster your business with wild, natural, and sustainable seafood from Alaska. Thank you very much.
retornar um pouquinho só para voltar o áudio. We will rewind this video so that we can have the audio stream. Olá e bem-vindos aqui de Juno, no Alaska. Eu sou a diretora senior de marketing do Alaska Seafood Marketing Institute. Quando eu comecei aqui há 13 anos, nós identificamos uma prioridade. Nós queríamos desenvolver o mercado na América do Sul. E nós também queríamos formar um relacionamento direto com a indústria nesta região. E isso se tornou uma realidade maravilhosa com um forte programa no Brasil. Mais ainda, no ano passado, tive a oportunidade incrível de visitar o Peru e de visitar alguns de vocês e as suas instalações. Eu diria que foi um destaque da minha carreira na ASME. E eu fiquei impressionada com a magnitude de oportunidades em poder crescer o seu negócio usando os nossos produtos. Eu gostaria de agradecer a todos por estar conosco hoje e pelo seu comprometimento com o pescado do Alasca. Espero que todos estejam bem, que se mantenham com saúde, para que a gente possa se encontrar pessoalmente. Cuidem-se mais uma vez. Muito obrigado pelo seu comprometimento com o Alasca. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Thank you very much, Valesca, Madeira, Hannah. For those of you who do not know me, I'm Carolina Nascimento. I am a partner of a River Global Consulting Company, and we represent ASME in Latin America. For those of you who are not familiar with ASME, with the Alaska Seafood Marketing Institute, It is a public-private partnership between the Alaska seafood industry and the state of Alaska. More than 200 companies from small family-owned fishing vessels to large global corporations. They export wild, natural, and sustainable fish from Alaska to different markets across the world. As we and us, we have the mandate to foster Alaska seafood trade by implementing marketing programs supporting all stakeholders in the seafood distribution channel. Besides our office in charge of South America and Mexico, there are eight offices worldwide working together to promote the seafood industry. Actually, I'd like to welcome all of you who have joined us. So this year we celebrate 10 years of this program in Brazil. And we are very happy because recently we expanded our efforts to Latin America. And just as Hannah mentioned, we strongly believe that the seafood industry in Latin America has many opportunities to be explored, to be tapped regarding Alaska seafood diverse products. And that's exactly what we'd like to share with you today. Our guests from Alaska Seafood Global Tour will share cases that were applied in different countries in order to bring you practical insights on how you can diversify and expand your activities regarding seafood processing and trading. If I had to choose one word to represent this event, or at least the, the word that motivated us to organize it, it's inspiration. We want to inspire you with a real and profitable business, going beyond traditional marketing. Without further ado, and we have a three hour program ahead of us, I would like to welcome another moderator, my colleague, Ricardo Torres. Good morning, Ricardo. Hello, Carol, good morning. It's great to be here with you and the other moderators, not to mention our participants. We will have many interesting sessions and I'd like to ask you to stay with us till the end. So good morning, everyone. Uh, we expect to have more than 500 
participants representing the industry, distributors, wholesalers, retailers, and seafood traders from Latin America, Europe, and Asia. For those of you who do not know me, I'm Ricardo Torres, Editor-in-Chief of Seafood Brazil Magazine and also a partner of Seafood Show Latin America and ASME for this event. Thank you very much. Carolina, I don't know if you remember, but I like to share the fact that exactly five years ago, Carolina, some Brazilian traders, ASME representatives and I, we were sailing the Bering Sea we had the opportunity to know some of the largest processing companies in Alaska. And we expect to share many opportunities and to motivate you to carry on with the business. So please also send us questions. You can use the Q&A icon at the lower portion of Zoom. Your question can be sent to us in your native language and it will be translated. It's also important to remind you that there are participants from different parts of the world and some of the presentations are pre-recorded because of the time zone difference. For example, I think it's 4 a.m. in Alaska, but anyway, you can send us your questions using the Q&A icon and we will share those with our speakers. So without further ado, let's start our program with uh, Dan Lash. He is a consultant and he manages research projects for the public and private sector, particularly regarding Alaska seafood. Some of these typical products involve market research, sustainability studies, and economic development. And because of the time zone difference, he sent us a pre-recorded message. So now let's have Dan's presentation in English. He will talk about uh, the seafood market worldwide despite the pandemic. So now let's have Dan Lash. So please select the language of your preference in order to follow Dan's presentation. Thank you. Well, thanks for opportunity to join you all down in South America. I'm sorry, can't be there in person, obviously. I um, hope you're all doing well in these strange times, staying healthy. So I'm joining you from Juneau, Alaska. My name is Dan Lash. I'm with the McKinley Research Group. We're a contractor for NASME, the Alaska Seafood Marketing Institute specializing in market research, economic analysis. We are, were formerly known as McDowell Group and have offices in Alaska, Anchorage and Juneau, Washington State. And we're part of the McKinley management family. I personally was born and raised in Gustavus near Glacier Bay National Park here in the southeast of Alaska near Juneau, the capital. And uh, a lot of fisheries happen down here in Southeast Alaska. I participated in, in several, including you know, long line halibut, shrimp, box shrimp fishing, uh, salmon, gill netting, and trolling. Obviously, a lot of our fisheries are also in the, around Kodiak, Prince William Sound, out here in the Bering Sea, and the Lucian Island chain. Overall, there's 29,000 fishermen on average. In our uh, fishing each year, 26,000 processing workers. The fishermen are harvesting up 2.6 million metric tons, or 2 billion, and fish and pen processors are turning that into 1.26 million metric tons, worth $4.7 billion annually. Those are averages. Uh, I'll show you a trend line here in a second. Alaska makes up about two thirds of the volume of US seafood produced each year. As you can see, our harvest volumes and wholesale volumes are quite steady year to year, despite the fact that we're dealing with wild populations that do fluctuate significantly year to year on individual species level. But as collectively as an industry, a lot of those differences will iron out and things will stay steady overall. Now, I don't have full year data for 2020. We did see a drop due to a variety 
many factors, but mostly in the biology side of things. When you look across the species that we that we're known for, you know, obviously salmon. Salmon still only makes up 14% of the harvest volume, about more than a third of the value, though. See them right here. Pollock is our biggest species, the biggest single species fishery in the world. Competes with the anchovies down your neck of the woods. Um, <clears throat> flatfish and rockfish make up 14% of the volume. Um, Pacific cod is important too, at 10% of the volume. Halibut sailfish and crab, while only 1% of the volume, obviously high value per pound, make up 10% and 10% uh, for crab and, and halibut sailfish, both on the value side. Just want to give you a sense in general of what we're talking about in the Alaska seafood industry and, and then transition to what I think is probably more relevant to you is to try to understand where does our seafood go around the world. I understand the, a lot of the subsequent panels will be going into specific stu case studies and examples. And I just want to provide some background to set the stage for that. You can see that this is so the product form as, as fish leaves Alaska to be consumed or further processed. Most of it, the, the biggest grouping is, is H and G fish that needs further processing. We have a lot of reprocessing that happens in China, but also in South Korea, Japan, the US, even in Europe. So fillets are only 20% of what leaves uh, surimi, others highly more highly processed, canning, fish meal and oil, and all other down here. In terms of the product form, 85% is frozen. So vast majority we're talking about is, is frozen. Fresh is only a couple percent, despite the fact that a lot of people, that's what they assume we're dealing with. And as you all know, we have to stabilize the products sent around the world. And as you can see here, specifically for canned salmon, one of the reasons why canned it is not, chub stable is not a bigger category is because we've seen this long-term trend over the last 20 years of declining canning in salmon from 40% in 2000 down to 14% in 2018. And most of that has, has gone to frozen HG, reducing an increase in inflate playing happening in our state as well, but the vast majority is still un, fairly unprocessed. About 75% of Alaska's seafood production is exported. The U.S. is our biggest single market at 25%, but um, in terms of export markets, China is our biggest trading partner, even though that's on the decline, which we'll talk more about in a second, that they're still our, our largest single trading partner um, on the export side. We export about $3 billion worth of seafood every year to over 100 countries. The end, our biggest end markets, as I said, the US, which is a growing market for us, it's our number one end market. Japan and Europe are the other most important end consumer markets for us. This, these bar charts kind of show you how which regions of the world are, are our exports go to. And China in, in the yellow here at the bottom has decreased quite a bit. We used to make up about 30% of our exports, and now it's down to 20% across the best, in large part due to the trade disputes and increased tariffs that, that we've seen since um, 2018. Europe is a growing export market for us, Southeast Asia as well reasons I'll discuss in a second, primarily because of the decline to China, the competitiveness of China as a reprocessing market has been on the decline for quite a while for various reasons. And one of the markets to pick, pick up some of that is Southeast Asia, although the volumes are still quite small. South Korea is also a growing market for us. Uh, Japan, on the other hand, is, is declining somewhat over the recent years. South America shows up down here in blue. It's an increasing, an increasing importance. So I'll dive more into that blue here in a second. So looking at China, I think one of the points I want to make is 
that we have seen a dramatic decrease in exports to China. Our, the value of our exports has declined 41% since 2017. And that's not just because of the tariffs. Other issues include the rising labor rates in, in China, which have decreased the competitiveness there for, for reprocessing market. Um, we've, we've seen, and I know you're probably familiar with this, we've seen as we conduct our trade mission around different parts of the world, South America, Peru, um, in Poland, and Eastern Europe, Southeast Asia, trying to help generate some markets, especially in the reprocessing side of things. Um, this is a long-term trend for us. At the same time as our exports declined 41%, global exports, seafood exports to China, the value of those increased 50% in 2017 and 2020. So we saw, we, we didn't take, we weren't able to take demand from China because of our politics issues. The biggest, in 2020, the biggest products that we're sending to Japan or to China. As you can see, on these small Asian G products, which is going to the agriculture industry there. Elephant sold did not use the top of our list, uh, but with the decline in others, their cod, like and others, for the first time in more than the first time ever, Elephant sold the top products by value sent to China in 2020. As you can see here, is uh, it a cod? Head and gutted frozen Pacific cod drops 65% value. That's partly due to finding fluctuating stocks that have dipped in the last couple of years for us. And uh, Pollock, on the other hand, our harvests are steady. Uh, there was a little, little blip last year due to slower fishing, but that was only like 5% decline. And, and that is not due to the, the stock strength, but we get. 60% decline in Alaska Pollock, frozen H&G to China. Salmon, there, there are multiple reasons for these for these things, but again, the overall trend is that we're depending less on China for reprocessing H&G product and looking for what we can do ourselves in growth in the domestic market and other reprocessing sectors around the world. South America, uh, the ASME region includes these countries here. This is here, Brazil and Mexico and, our, and Chile are most important markets for us in South America, have been for some time. You can see we saw a decline basically across the board in 2020. The top products here, we've got fish oil, the top uh, going to the Chilean salmon farming industry, canned salmon to Mexico, Salmon frozen. Ecuador, um, Chileans pick up a good amount of sockeye salmon, different flatfish, uh, rock sole, yellowfin sole in Mexico, quita salmon, uh, headed and gutted frozen to Brazil and Colombia, and then significant amounts of plastic pollock fillet, salmon grow going to Brazil. Many other products going to many other countries, but I just wanted to highlight the top eight here. So, of course, we're talking about the global pandemic. Um, in Alaska, we're somewhat lucky right now in terms of our rates, case rates, and uh, while the country as a whole has experienced a lot. A very high rate of infection. I know that uh, everyone's struggling around the world with this issue. In, in terms of our industry, specifically the COVID 19 pandemic caused dramatically increased operating costs. Our fisheries went off without major interruption last year in 2020. Um, there were a couple of reasons for that, but the biggest that I guess the point that I want to make is that cost increase. We saw about 50 to 
to sixty billion dollars to increase the processors, operating fishermen. We have to quantify that. At this point. Uh, we saw no dramatic, rapid demand shifts from food service as those shut those places shut down to retail. We also saw a lot of transportation logistical challenge, challenges, including air travel, where a lot of our fresh seafood, higher value seafood travel on airplanes. That wasn't as always as possible last year. But perhaps some of the biggest transportation issue were, were delays into China with the inspection and port backups and supports in northern China. So we've talked to processors that loaded ships in Dutch Harbor in September of 2020 and still have not unloaded their, their trampers in Delia. So just some of the major issues. We also saw a weakening dollar the last uh, since, since the pandemic, about down about from pre pandemic. Looking at this demand shift, uh, a huge spike in major sales, retail, grocery store, uh, jumping, being up here, getting stocked up, fill their manager for, for to hunger down. And then, but staying quite high, and in the red here, you can see around 30% increase in sales for a given week compared to the year previous uh, for both frozen and uh, fresh seafood. So seafood has been the food sector perhaps the most as, as well are probably intimately familiar and seafood within food has, has been able to capture the uh, uh, market. One of the reasons why we saw this big jump is you know, it's partly a story of supply chain being pretty resilient and a lot of flexibility built into the seafood supply chain because of the fluctu huge fluctuations that we can see in, in uh, harvest and timing and some of the natural factors. We were able to stay on those shelves and have more flexible supply chains than some of the other proteins. And so the, this, this story here is partly is largely about increased demand and having a protein that really resonated with customers and also about the, the ability of the industry to operate by that demand, that demand. We have, we up here are really proud of our seafood industry and how it came together. Dealt with all these changing requirements and challenges in the pandemic 2020. Um, 2021 has been harder because of higher case rates and, you know, when our, some of our fisheries started going this, this January, so uh, several massive plants have to shut down for extended periods of time, the highest infection rates we've seen, and unfortunately, you know, a few deaths. So some of the impacts that we escaped in 2020. Um, so, so far, a harder uh, landscape for us right now. We're hopeful that the vaccine rates will allow our industry to um, fully operate and put the vaccinated workforce summer salmon season. So, again, my name is Dan Lesh. And my email address is here. I want to thank you for your time for the opportunity to talk with you all. Um, I, I hope you have a, a great time exploring all the different ways in which last Hello, everyone. Is everything okay? Yes. Well, before I say anything about Dan's presentation, 
I'd like to once again remind you that we are offering simultaneous interpretation services. So if you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you are going to find a globe, an interpretation icon, or you go to the ellipses if you are using your cell phone and then click interpretation and select the language of your choice. And please send us messages in our chat box so that we can also help you. Okay, great, wonderful. Okay, so Dan's presentation had many charts, but I'd like to highlight some points. First, it's very interesting to understand what Alaska produces, the different species and the global uh, market and how Alaska products are sold worldwide. And obviously we talk about uh, raw material, frozen seafood, and we know it accounts for 80% of Alaska's production. So it's very important to think about uh, reprocessing opportunities in the long term. Another point I'd like to highlight is obviously 2020 numbers are very atypical because we're talking about a global pandemic. But as Glenn Dan mentioned, we are very proud of how the industry responded to this challenge. My last comment, numbers that uh, showed this drop in export to China. The way I see it, it represents opportunities for us in Latin America. So where are we going now to send this raw material that was going, that used to be shipped to China? So perhaps we can use that as an opportunity to grow our business. So this is just a common food for thought. Now, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. He is very knowledgeable about uh, global marketing. He's a very good partner. Our next speaker is live from Buenos Aires, Franco Parabini. He is the director of JP Clausen. He represents actually JP Clausen in South America. So now I'm going to switch it to Spanish. So once again, please do use interpretation services available. So select the language of your choice at the Zoom icon. Good morning, Franco. It is a great honor to have you with us today. Thank you very much. First and foremost, thank you very much for this opportunity. It is an honor to be able to talk to you. And for those that don't know me, I, as Carolina said, I am Franco Marabini. I am director G. Congelados Atlantico Sur. We are representatives of J.P. Clausen in South America that belongs to the Nisun Japanese group. And this is a major group and their leaders in the fishing industry. The group has boats, commercial offices, plants, and even all over the world, even in Alaska. In South America, J.P. Clausen has three business lines that are export, imports, and also the reprocessing of fish and seafood. Now I would like to talk about them. I'm going to present you the three main lines here, but I'll show you the last line. Approximately five years ago, six years ago, J.P. Clausen developed a reprocessing line of wild Argentine prawns in Peru. We send headed prawns to Peru, they are peeled and they are re-exports to other sides of the world. In the beginning, our target market was Europe because we have companies of the group in Europe. 
but we started the first year, we started with two and three containers, we reprocessed them, we would package them in bulk with no major packaging because this would go more to food service. And after the first year, we produced 500 tons in Peru. And the second year, everything changed suddenly because J.P. Clausen saw that there was great opportunity in the U.S. and Canadian market. And as of that moment, we focused on the, those markets. We made a good effort. We had to find new customers and we had to work with new products, with new packaging, say, with a greater design and with more technology. So. So we started making bags of different sizes with special zippers, with pouches. We even use biodegradable material and printed in many colors. And this was a major bet that gave us good results because today we produce over 3,500 tons of finished products on a yearly basis in Peru and we give jobs to around 200 people and also we JP Clausen sells to the main importers of prawns from Canada and the US JP Clausen products today are present in the main supermarket chains of the United States and Canada, like Kroger, Costco, Walmart, Albertsons, amongst other supermarket chains. So based on this successful experience with our prawns, and thanks to the requirements of our customers, who were seeking alternatives to bringing products down from Asia and specifically China, we grew more and we began to reprocess fish in Peru. And this has allowed us to have a broader product portfolio and to better supply our customers. And we also made the most of the know-how that we had acquired through all of this time and we created new sales channels during this period. Well, we first began with a whitefish from South America. We sent several containers of whitefish to Peru. Luckily, fortunately, they came out very well. They were sent to the United States, but in suing this, this business failed. Now, why did it fail? Because we were unable to obtain regularity in the supply of fish in South America due to the price variations for fish in the region. Beginning with that, we began to investigate further. We were contacted by ASMI and we came to the conclusion that there is an excellent opportunity to reprocess the products from Alaska and South America for a variety of reasons. For example, the products from Alaska have that regularity and the volumes of the main savage fish in Alaska are maintained year after year. And all of this thanks to the responsible management of fishery in Alaska. Because of this, there is less price variation as we had observed in our products. Of course, they are variations, but within normal regions. These are wild fish. These are fish that are sold throughout the world and known throughout the world. The sales channels are enormous and we have representations of surimi, the shatter pack fillets, small portions, kirimi, 
what is positive about all of this is that if we purchase raw material to process, we will have several sales channels and markets at hand. Brazil is one of the great consumers of the filets that come from Alaska. Another advantage of Alaska is that it has all of the necessary certifications that are required worldwide in the main markets. Sustainability certifications, uh, traceability and quality control certifications. And of course, this represents an advantage if we wish to work with the main retail channels, it is necessary to have certifications and also have certifications for reprocessing. And Alaska, of course, is the perfect place for all of this. With uh, all of this, I truly believe that nowadays Latin America is faced with an enormous challenge on the one hand, but also a huge opportunity on the other hand to become a very good alternative for importers who are purchasing uh, processes, uh, products from Alaska that are being processed in China. Once again, we are faced with a huge opportunity and we should make the most of it. As a group, as J.P. Clausen, we have begun to carry out tests. We have used the yellowfin sole. Uh, and after this, we're going to work with the Alaska Pollock. And without a doubt, we will continue on with the main products, uh, salmon, cod, and all of the other products that come out. The broader our product portfolio ends up being, the better for our customers. This is all. And uh, I would like to thank you for the opportunity. And once again, I am at your disposal for questions and answers. Thank you very much, Franco. And uh, please send your questions using the Q&A section of Zoom. Franco is at your disposal to answer the questions. Franco, we do have a question from Dan's presentation, and I think we should respond to it. It refers to the outlook that we have of how to continue with the trade with China. It seems that J.P. Clausen has experience in that field, but uh, working with these markets, is this part of the radar of J.P. Clausen? Are there any recommendations that you would like to make to the exporters and reprocessors in the region so that they can perhaps begin their business and allow for a growth and become ever more involved in the export of fish? Well, there are several questions here. When it comes to China and Latin America and reprocessing as a whole, I honestly believe that this is the right timing for several issues because of the variables that are involved at present. On the one hand, we have the trade problems that exist between between the United States and China uh, and what is happening in the United States. The logistic problems uh, that China has at present to send a container from China to Europe or the United States can be extremely costly. There are additional issues, the production costs in China have soared considerably. 
And there's a very simple uh, point here. Customers are requesting products that do not originate from China. And we have offices in China. We have been reprocessing considerably in China, but our customers are requesting products that do not come from China. And of course, China will continue to be a giant and we are but a small option to China. And I believe that the Alaska exporters should begin to set their sights on Latin America, especially for the reprocessing. And for those who are willing to reprocess, those that are already reprocessing, and of course, this will represent a new business. I think this represents an excellent opportunity. It's not easy to compete with China. China has 30 years of experience in reprocessing fish. They have a logistic network that is incredible. And the fish of Alaska goes to Korea, then goes to China, returns to Alaska. And of course, this is something we have to keep in mind. But beyond all of this, there are very good opportunities. And the opportunities are not only for Peru, any other market can do this. But we do have idle capacity in our plants in Peru to be able to reprocess food coming from other origins. We have the skill and the experience of reprocessing fish. It is, of course, a challenge, but I am convinced that we can be successful. Thank you, Franco. Thank you very much. We have a variety of questions here in the Q&A, but because of our time constraints, we will not be able to respond to all of them. Once again, this event is an inspiration so that all of us in the fish industry can seek out raw material, see where we can process them, reprocess them, and then export to Asia and other markets. We have Chile, Ecuador, and well, the example presented by Franco, of course, was very important. Franco, subsequently, I will send you all of the questions that we have here, and jointly, we will respond to them after the event. Very good, thank you. Thank you once again for your participation, Franco. Thank you for the opportunity. Of course, you're always welcome. And keep sending your questions. We're going to answer all of them. And we're now going to go on to the next speaker. My call upon Ricardo. We're going to here from Peru. So, Ricardo, if you could speak about the new presentation. Of course, Carolina, we continue here in Spanish. Thank you very much. And we are now going to have another live presentation from Lima, Peru. I would like to remind all of you to Please uh, remain with us. We do have a long program with very interesting presentations. I would like to welcome Mr. David Epstein, the CEO of Oceano Corporation. David, are you here with us? Welcome, welcome, David. And as I was saying, David Epstein is a CEO of Oceano Corporation, and he will speak to us about what is happening with fish in Peru. And uh, he will speak about how to better develop the business. He is once again, the CEO of Oceano 
Corporation and the president of the Fishery and Aquaculture Committee of the National Society of Industries, the SNI. We give the floor to Mr. David Epstein, therefore. Good morning. It is a pleasure to be able to make this presentation. We're going to speak about a new business and marketing approach for fish. At this moment, I will share my screen with you. Yes, we are sharing the screen directly with all the participants. If you prefer, of course, you can share the presentation. Yes, because the presentation that was sent is not the full presentation. Thank you. Very well, thank you. Thank you. I have 10 minutes to speak about Peru as the president of the Fishery and Aquaculture Committee of the Society of National Industry and as the CEO of Oceano Corporation. This is a fishing group that is very important in the development of the fish industry. Basically, I would like to share with you through data what is happening with fishing and aquaculture in Peru. We have 150,000 jobs, 90% outside of Lima and Calla, which is the most important port in Peru. The sector generates more than a million direct jobs and 50% of our staff is female. In terms of the exports that we have with direct labor in 2019, it represented a thousand 592 million in 2020, there was a reduction. The plant capacity, as Franco mentioned a few minutes ago, is from 35 to 40% of utilized capacity. We contribute with 10% of non-traditional exports and We have an industry that has a minimum wage, which is quite high of 1,606 soles to be able to work with this. In Peru, we have 122 plants of frozen fish, 24 for cured fish, 65 for canned fish, with a total of 211. And there have been very little variations since 19, 60% of the fishing plants are found in Piura and Ancash. Now we're going to speak about the strategic partnership with Alaska and the uh, Society, National Society of Industries in Peru. Now, which is the goal of this? The goal is to have Peru as a hub for reprocessing. Uh, especially for the Alaska Pollock, the wild salmon, hake, and for this dialogue, for this project, the stakeholders, of course, were the National Society of Industries, the uh, fishing committees of Alaska, the North American Embassy in Peru, the companies in Alaska, as you can see, Sogda Limited, American Seafoods Company, Icicle Seafoods and others. And we have Sanipes, which is the sanitary uh, authority in Peru and the vice minister of fishery in Peru. Now, why have we chosen Peru? Because Peru has a strategic geographic location. It is a country with a very long fishing trajectory worldwide. It is competitive in cost, have 
qualified labor and sufficient plant capacity for frozen fish and reprocessing. Now we implemented this project in Peru based on these milestones. And all of this is very important because of seasonality. And we do want to have the support of Alaska. We would like to increase revenues, uh, stabilize costs. Now, we go back to our milestones on March 6, 2020. We held the presidency of the uh, National Society of Industry sent a letter to the presidency of the Republic requesting the project for processing frozen fish from Alaska. And once again, it, the letter was sent directly to the president of the Republic. The process begins and on August 15 of 2020, Sanipes, the sanitary authority, uh, authorizes the pilot program. Of course, this program was a short span program, but we're convinced that it will be extended. These are the companies that are associated to the Fishing and Agriculture Committee, of which I am the president, Aka Pesca, Arcorpa, Alfamar, Coin Refri, DSM, DPM, Santa Monica, Carabela, Dexin, Heidek, Fernandez, Peru Pes, Pacific Dream, Peruvian, Proanco, Sabanamar, Marfrio, Pesquera Diamante, Sacana, Seafrost, Iprisco, and others. In truth, we have a very large number of industries that are interested in taking advantage of this project. The date of launch, as you will recall, was March 6, 2020, but this coincides with the lockdown in Peru and elsewhere in the world. And it has been very difficult, of course, because this is the main channel that we have with Alaska. And there was a drop in demand at that point. We've had a need to reinvent ourselves industrially in order to deal with the crisis and the pandemic. But I believe that all crises represent an opportunity. And when you make the best out of an opportunity, this becomes a success. And now we have the opportunity to materialize a win-win situation. And uh, we will be able to develop this from Peru as a hub. In Peru, we have the industrial capacity and we have the possibility with our products to develop the domestic market. Now, I would like to talk about Oceano Corp where I'm an executive director. And basically here you have the main species that we work with. And here you do not have the species that Alaska exports. We don't have wild salmon. We don't have hake. We don't have pollock. And our hake is different. And this complements our products. And it's interesting to us. This is the portrait of 2019 regarding markets and in the middle of 2020, this is going to change the percentage of destination of exports of Oceano seafood will increase in North America. And this is something that we already see and this is an important opportunity. We are also working with our domestic market. Today we have products for retail. We're in the main supermarkets with mahi-mahi, prawns, 
uh, rings and we are going to incorporate products of wild salmon and Pollock. It is important to highlight that in Peru, as Grupo Oceano, we reprocess wild Argentine prawns. And obviously, this is increasing, like it happens with J.P. Clausen. We believe that rapidly we will be able to reprocess products imported from Alaska to our domestic market to be exported, already reprocessed. So basically, this is this is the Oceano brand that has been relaunched with this new art and we expect to incorporate the products that we will reprocess in the near future. We are in contact with Alaskan companies. Our commercial team is already in conversations to start importing. And we believe that this will be an important opportunity because Oceano Group has five plants in the south, in the center, and in the north of Peru. And this is an opportunity to complement our portfolio. So this is my presentation. I know we didn't have a lot of time, but I hope that it was a complete presentation. It was very complete. Thank you very much, Mr. Davi. We have a couple of questions. In reality, we have more questions but I will ask you a few questions because of our time. I will start with my question. I do have the a right because I'm the mediator and I'm a journalist. So I would like to comment and I would like to state something that we mentioned in the beginning of the webinar. And we, we said that China is focusing in its domestic market and this reflects the organization of this industry, like in hubs like Xingtao. And this and the effects of the pandemic, you know, create opportunities to have new hubs in Latin America, also based in the Peruvian industries and players that are so important for this industry. What is your view on this? What is your take here? what we see throughout the, the world establishes opportunities and changes, generates. So in reality today, international trade regarded, regarding added valued products in the fishing industry is changing. Countries like uh, Peru that are origin in terms of exports and it exports to China, to Spain, so that the products are reprocessed and they are re-exported to nearby markets to us, like the United States. And now we don't have to go through them, but we can go directly to the nearby markets. I believe that Latin America is consolidating itself as an important market. We export a lot to Colombia, to Brazil, and other countries in the region. I think that competitiveness regarding costs, well, we don't, we don't need interme intermediaries like China. What is happening? Peru is undergoing an important investment process regarding updating the technical part of their plants. We have Paita that is a very important uh, city. We, amongst others, we have Pisco, Chimbote that are very important for the fishing industry. But Paita has a great amount of fishing plants. So what is our view here is to turn Paita into a hub to provide better quality of life to people that live and work in Paita so that they can thrive and we want Paita to become a focus of development of added value with competitive products and directly replace something like China or could be other destinations to go to nearby markets like the US and the Canadian markets, maybe Europe. I believe that there will be a lot of competition regarding who makes progress 
quicker. We all, I'm not going to say that this is a trade war, but there is trade competition regarding origin and destination. And when we work jointly with the partners that we have throughout the world, we will be able to take these efficiencies and this will become a commercial success. It's a challenge, but we're on the right path. Now let's go to the next question. If you could briefly answer this question, it is a question about the fleet. And this comes from Emerson de Oliveira. And the question will be in Portuguese, OK? The Peruvian seafood industry is concerned with uh, the Chinese seafood industry, considering its own zone. Did you understand the question? Can you hear me? Okay. All right. The fishing industry, the formal and legal fishing industry is something that we defend globally. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't generalize when we talk about the Chinese or non-Chinese fleet, what I can say is that any fishery that doesn't uphold the laws and doesn't respect the sovereignty of countries like ours, well, has to be banned and we will not accept this. If there are boats of any flag that are not upholding the international fishing laws, they should be sanctions. We hope that there are very few or none. And in terms of quality, this is very personal. I would never generalize. It wouldn't be correct to generalize because in all countries and throughout the world, we have very good businessmen and very few that do not uphold the international rules. And I do urge them to do it. What we're doing in terms of fleet, we are formalizing the our trolling fishing, our troll fishing in Brazil, in Peru, which is excellent for us. Thank you, Davi. It was a pleasure and thank you very much. It was a, and I do congratulate you for everything that you're doing. So we hope to see you and your entire team in October in our seafood show. So we will continue with our program. Thank you very much again, Mr. David. Now I will give the floor to Carolina again. And now we will continue in Portuguese. I would like to remind you how important it is to change to the language of your preference. I hear, thank you, Ricardo. Everything is okay. So, hello, just a comment, Davi. Thank you very much for your presentation. A very nice presentation, everything you are doing in Peru. Another comment about uh, the global market and understand what are the advantages of reprocessing in new markets. To us, why is Peru a country that uh, makes sense? not only to us, but for Latin America. Well, the raw material from Alaska will arrive in Peru without a tax in, import taxes. It will become a Peruvian product. And then from there, it will benefit from all trade agreements that Peru already have in place with uh, Europe, with the Mercosur. So I think that this is an opportunity and that is applicable to Chile, to Colombia, perhaps Colombia to a lesser extent, but uh, they could take advantage of reprocessing. So just to inspire you, food for thought again. So let's move on with this program. And now we are going to switch continents. So we have a guest from the Netherlands. 
Our guest is Matthijs van Aspern. He is the director of Catch BV. So now we're going to switch to English. So once again, please select the language of your preference at the interpretation icon in the lower part of Zoom. And don't forget to send us question using the Q&A icon. How are you? Welcome. Hi. Yes, I can. Welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you here with us for the last season of Global Tour today. Um, let me just uh, provide the audience with a little bit more of information. Uh, Matthias will share with us a bit of his experience in developing and creating a new European hub for processing and distribution of the Alaska Pollock, but the genuine one, the one really coming from Alaska. So, Matthijs, thank you so much, and uh, if the room is yours. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, we heard a lot about uh, the good things about Alaska, and uh, I think the one thing that I was missing is the quality of the fish. Uh, what you see is that in Brazil they are importing uh, more from China, but that is something that you can compare to the last one. That is something that has been It's like actually comparing a Mercedes or a Ferrari to a Fiat or a Ford or whatever. Uh, the fish from Alaska, the sea frozen in Alaska, more like that is the Ferrari, the Mercedes under the, the fish. So quality, that is the thing that you should base your, uh, your business on. Because the people, they want quality, that's the most important thing. Uh, and the quality of the Alaska Pollock is so constant and so high that there is actually not many fish that they can compare to that. Uh, and of course you can get special uh, forms from China that will not have the quality in the, the sea frozen product from Alaska. So that's the, the main thing that we have here in, in, in Holland uh, based our thing. So uh, we have a steady and constant high quality through the year, the year in, the year out. And of course, then there is the background. Uh, about uh, how it is controlled. So uh, there is no, not a fishery better controlled than the fishery in Alaska. And that's of course that the, the consumers for them, that's getting more and more important. Uh, carbon footprint, all those things. And, uh, yeah, that's the most important thing. Uh, so, yeah, that's the key thing. In, in our business, constant quality throughout the whole year, and, and you cannot get it uh, elsewhere. And of course, we have the, the good thing about the last one if you use it as your box, that there is, it is so versatile. This is one of the pictures in the factory where we make uh, products for the supermarkets and all. Uh, we cut the box by machine. And then we separate them, the, 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 the smaller pieces, then we better them, we pre fry them, and then they are sent off in MA packaging to, uh, to the supermarket. And uh, this is one leg where we stand on, and the other leg is that we sell it to the wholesale markets. And then they use it, we sell it on the streets as a street finger food. And, and that market has grown steadily by 15 to 20 percent each year. So we started up for uh, maybe uh, one or two thousand tons each year in the Dutch market, and now we are above 10,000 tons for the Alaska Pollock. So I don't know if there is anything more that people want to know. Yeah, of course. Actually, I want to go over the pictures that you shared with us. So, as you're saying, you you working with uh, Alaska Pollock, please coming from the blue. 
blocks, right? So yes. just uh, wanted to to showcase to our audience how this how this product looks like. So Valeska, if you could please go back a little bit and uh, show us uh, the piece, the, the cut they made from they make from the blocks. Please go back. Yeah, sure. Here. So you receive it. What's the sign of the company? Yeah. It's in the industrial block, blocks, as always, the same sign, so it's like a little bit over it, 40 centimeters. And then we cut it, uh, depending on the film size, we cut it in 10 or 8 uh, stripes. Uh, then you get uh, pieces of one stripe, which is about 750.
wonderful product, which is very similar in size, of course, so it's very good for retail, uh, where you have, uh, where you can marinate, where you can do breading, uh, battery, pre-drying, everything, what you want. So you can, uh, it's, it's very first, it's just, yeah, there is no better moment in the market for a product like this. Very interesting. So I have a question coming from the audience and uh, I'll switch to Portuguese because the discussion is coming from Emerson. Okay, so switch to the translation channel. <laughs> Emerson, uh, a pergunta. Emerson's question. Well, how do you manage fraud? in the seafood fillet. Do you run any DNA test in your market? Sorry. Oh, it's okay. So basically he's asking uh, how quality control is done in your market. So do they run DNA tests on the species or even if we're going, we're going to talk about quality, how do they with a chemical, so how do you ensure that uh, you're really buying that species? Well, that's the good thing about if you work together with a, a company which you know for a very long time, so that's why we work with American Seafoods and we know that's the good thing about the elastic force frozen, there are no chemicals, so it's just the, the product as it is, so uh, they don't use all they don't use uh, whatever. Uh, it's not like Shuriki where they have edibles or anything. Just that's what it is. It's frozen uh, from, uh, it's reprocessed from a, a, a fish into a fillet within four to six hours. So that's it. It's the fish. It's, you cannot get it even more fresh. Yeah, only if you catch it yourself by your rods. But otherwise, there is no way to get it fresher than it's frozen from a less. So there is no issues on, on, on those uh, additives or whatever. Okay, so basically you as an importer and processor, you are the one taking you know, care of uh, the, the raw material that you're using. Yeah. So Emerson, I hope the question uh, is responded. If not, please reach out to me and then we can talk to Matai. Okay, so Matai, thank you so much for your participation. I think that the features were very illustrative. And again, it was a pleasure to have you here with us today. Thank you. Wish you all the best. You. Okay. you too. Bye. Bye bye. People, we're starting. Actually, we're going to keep. Uh, the event language in English because uh, I'm uh, asking my colleague Valis to lead the next uh, presentation with uh, our guest. Valeska, Valeska, are you there? Okay. Good. Carolina. Olá. Olá. Obrigada. So, uh, bom. I'll continue in English so that we can have our next speaker. Okay, so let me check if he's here with us. Perfect. Towards the end of the first of your two panels, I would like to introduce our next speaker. He's from China, the largest reprocessing Center for Seafood Worldwide. Welcome, Jerry Zhang from Ocean Gala. That's just to start the, okay, it's coming? Okay, great. Jerry, you are in, you are in mute? You are in mute. Let me ask you to end Can you hear me? Yes, now perfect. Finally. Thank you very much. Welcome again oh, for being with us so late in the night. Yeah. Really appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the uh, great evening in Shanghai. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Jerry Chen. Uh, I'm the founder of the Ocean Gala brand. Um, we 
uh, Steve Houdin for the base in Seattle for 27 years. We are also a uh, processor in China since uh, early 2000. Um, I started business uh, in Seattle in 1994. So we, we entered the passing business in China in 2002. And then we uh, invested to uh, um, see the plan in 2005. Uh, today, we are brand developer uh, um, in China. We are distributed in China and we are still uh, import in Seattle. Uh, we have, um, basically we have, uh, have a brand called the premium brand called Ocean Gala. And we also have the online brand called Fresh Element, as well as the Ocean Elegance um, Flexible for the very end. Next, uh, next, uh, that's what for the next slide, please. Hello, yes, and then the uh, next slide, please. So, so we are the lead service company of industry in China. We are uh, voted as top in most uh, influential Chinese seafood brands, and also we uh. Uh, top 10 best known seafood import in China and also the most favorite seafood brand by online consumers in China. Next slide, please. So today we are uh, focused on the online and retail business. We are selling to the um, uh, many retails. Olay, Metro, Costco, and uh, and also the online offline uh, sectors like uh, Huma and uh, also the hotel chains. That's the uh, pretty much we're selling to the over um, a few, uh, maybe 100, 200 cities and uh, um, so over, over 2,000 other lands. So next slide, you can see our product. The typical product display in the in the supermarket on our brand. In the next slide, so we also uh, operate uh, some uh, fresh seafood counters inside the high end supermarket chains in China, such as Beijing, Shanghai, Tianjin, Qingdao, and Jinan, and some other major cities in China. So I would like to share with the audience uh, how we promote seafood or import seafood in China, such as Alaska seafood. The next slide will show you that we um, first, you know, we do several um, approaches, such as join the marketing with the uh, embassy or trade office of the United States and some other city, some other countries, and also we. Uh, we do join the market in the Marine Food Council, with the Chinese uh, franchise chains and WWF to promote seafood. We also partner, partnering with major global seafood brands, um, um, as well in Europe and the United States. And such as uh, also we do organizing hosting cooking show in the canary. Uh, and sometimes we do live promoting major social media platforms such as live stream show, um, and, and also we do demo or sample test at my market weekly, monthly, bi-weekly, and on the cities and on the channels. We also do the uh, creative cooking video to educate and promote the input such as uh, Alaska C. So today we have, we are proud to uh, say that we uh, promote single frozen Alaska pollock in East China and also in the Olay supermarket chain in China. Next slide. Um, I like to talk a little bit of why fish processing current situation in China. Next slide, please. Hello? Yes, thank you. Current 
actually um, white muscle. Basically, what I mean is that from, from Alaska, from Russia, passes the inside Chinese plant and reacts to North American Europe, such as pollock, Pacific cod, Attic, Atlantic cod, redfish. So today we are facing a high cost, the labor cost. Um, the typical workers' wages about five hundred U.S. dollars per month. So at a certain point, we'll we'll see how this will compare to machine. Should we continue processing, or could it be replaced by a machine in the future? And also, there will be a less and less workers are willing to work in the city of China. Because usually they have more choice. They can work for the electronic company. They can work for the other you know, um, service companies. Instead of working in the uh, cold, wet environment in the city of China. And uh, currently, the um, most Chinese city plants are Finance support from local bank because the local bank be they believe it's a certain high risk. The processors' margin getting low and lower, and even sometimes they have to work at the negative margins to keep the plan around. So, what's the result? The result of the less and the less. Risk. Also, the result will be push the uh, currently white fish plant with the best market in China in terms of uh, re export market. However, China is still a huge emerging market. So I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about the, the China, what's the China in the market opportunity in China. Next slide, please. Then next slide. So China was the first major economy in the world to emerge from COVID-19 pandemic with positive GDP growth. Uh, if you look at the uh, the uh, 2020 Q2, China started to recover, and then um, the continued to increase the GDP. Q3, Q4, 2020. And that's making the only country in the world to return to the pre COVID level by the end of the last year. The average GDP in 2020 is roughly about 3.2%. Next slide, please. And, and then we talk about uh, what retail market in China. Um, for the whole year, 2020, China total retail sales declined by 3.9% after being down as much as 20% in early 2020. Growth in retail market does not suffer as much as other sectors during the height of COVID-19. Online shopping exploded in 2020 as lockdown and the social distancing throttled the e-commerce sectors. E-commerce now accounts for nearly one quarter of China total retail sales and 4.2% higher than 2019. Online retail sales up 10.9% in 2020, and the new retail formats such as O2O, which is online to offline, continue to be reliable for the daily purchase. So then we talk about the uh, food service next page. The food service HRI, which is hotel, restaurant, institutions, that sector maintain remaining the impressed is recovered from COVID nineteen, which catering are heavily followed by three months. Dining traffic prompted by nearly 90% in Lunar New Year. The HRI revenue in 
2020, in October 2020, increased 0.8 percent from 2019. The like first positive growth within the year is consumer regain confidence. New development in HRI including contactless delivery, make at home kits, ritualize the menu, take out menu by premium hotels, uh, and online food delivery service market increase significantly. 17.1 billion transactions. Online delivery, delivery user reached 419 million by the end of the year. So, as the uh, major input safety brand operate, we work with uh, Shangri La, uh, it's the, one of the high end uh, hotel chains in China, by selling their. And we got pretty good success. That's how you know the service was huge impacted. Now they are going to selling to the retail. So next slide we'll talk about that. The input. The input is projected to largely surpass export for the next 10 years to reach 4.52 million metric tons by year 2024. That's what this, uh, we, we uh, expected much more input from the Chinese market. And then I talk about the next slide, talk about a little bit about China seafood consumption trend. You look at the uh, next slide. The consumer more books on quality and safety. So if you look at the left side, about fifty percent consumers say, "Hey, I want fresh, fresh, fresh." And the versus about fifty percent, "Hey, I want to have safety." And then you look at about the white side and family is a lovers become a main consumer so that's an age group minus 28 years old 20 30 30 45 and uh, 45 and older if you look at the, uh, about 44 percent the, the buy seat for family which is 51 30 to 45 years old age group, they have a 51% they buy seafood for the family. And seafood larvae seems like 20, 30 years old group age, about 43% they are seafood larvae. That's given us a lot of confidence in the more and more young generation. Uh, they prefer seafood, and, and, you know, which give us a lot of more confidence in seafood larvae. And the last page I talk about the a little bit is is about the awareness of the sustainability in the country. So if, when you look at these sustainabilities and traceability, it's become a more important certainly for Chinese consumers. Uh, and we have uh, um, promotion staff national. Um, insights talking to consumers um, some every day, some weekend. And we got a lot of service in the back of um, our marketing mission. And uh, this is from the main sold council, which more or less said it, we got from our It's about 97% Consumers say, hey, I really want to know where this uh, product comes from. That's in the left side. If you look at the right side, the about 49% consumers say, hey, I don't want to pay premium for the MS papers. However, about 41% the 
is the red box saying, hey, I'm willing to pay really this line. So definitely the sustainability and the traceability become a more important a consumer want to know in China. That's the end of my conversation and thank you for attention. Hi, Jerry. Hi, how are you? Good. Thank you so much for the presentation. Very interesting to see yeah, my how pleasure. the market changes in China. We have a yeah. couple of questions for you coming from the audience. Yeah. So I'm, uh, I'm going to switch to Portuguese because of the, the questions coming in Portuguese, okay? So turn yeah, on no, the, the, yes. <laughs> the translation, okay. Uh, okay, so this question is from Alexander. His question is the following. Products that are processed and uh, sold in your market, do you use any additives, both for the domestic and foreign markets? Can you please comment on that? Did you get the question from the interpreters? No, okay, so let me translate it then. Okay, so Alexandre is asking if uh, any type of uh, chemicals or any type of uh, are used in the products that are distributed in the domestic uh, market of China or even that you export to other markets in the region or back to the US? Well, when you talk about the uh, white fish processing for North American market to uh, processing China, follow the uh, specification of customing systems and the chemical STPP, sodium triphosphate is a typical chemical used in the Alaska Pollock block and IKF Pollock as well. For China domestic market, the, we have a strict label. You know, when you're adding something, you have you need to add some additives. So um, we are generally have very strict uh, control on the, uh, the labels. And if we add something, uh, we will definitely will label it. But uh, most of our product, we are pretty much chemical free for China domestic market because we, our main retail is for the high, medium, high end supermarket chain. Yes. Yeah, good. So the next question is coming from Emerson. And Emerson is asking us uh, about uh, the trade disability between China and the US. And uh, he wants to know how the market in China was affected by these trade concerns and how did your company react to that? It's very interesting question. Question uh, has been asked by uh, many uh, friends in the last uh, couple of uh, years. Um, the during the uh, Trump administration, uh, Trump imposed the heavy tariff to the uh, Chinese seafood import to the United States. As a retaliation, Chinese stock imposed the uh, same percentage of uh, tariff to the import of seafood. From the United States. So, for example, um, uh, uh, let me give you Alaska Pollock. Uh, Alaska Pollock is used to be two percent tariff importing to China. Now we have to pay additional twenty five percent, which is twenty seven percent. But that's the huge, you know, tariff increase for the uh, import seafood from the uh, United States. Uh, well, our company do that. So we uh, some of the product we still import from the United States, but we also find the substitute substitute such as we uh, we get black card from Canada, uh, we get uh, you know uh, the lobster from Canada, you know basically just to find some uh, uh, 
substitutions for the uh, to reduce the impact of these high tariff uh, um, from the U.S. space and sea. Great, thank you. Very clear. So, Jerry, uh, as we're running out of time with your session, but uh, I wanted to thank you for the presentation, for sharing your experience in the Chinese market. I think that we have a lot to learn, especially when we see how the market is developing domestically. And uh, I do believe that a lot of the trades that we just present to us are the same ones that we're seeing in Latin America. So, once again, thank you so much for your participation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, switching to Portuguese now. Um, pessoal, querido, vou voltar aqui. Okay, everyone. So I'd like to turn it over to Valesca, and I'd like to add the following. Jeremy's presentation allowed us to understand the changes that China is undergoing, its impact on global market, and uh, how China emerges as a domestic market. At a certain point, it will be no longer a reprocessing center, or it will undergo relevant changes, opening opportunities for other markets. To me, that's the lesson learned. Okay, Valesca, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. I see many questions and many messages. So keep on doing that. Send us your questions, comments, suggestions. That's why we are holding this webinar today. OK, we will now have a very short break, a five minute break. And meanwhile, we will uh, share two videos, one from the Alaska marketing uh, seafood marketing institute as me and uh one video from seafood show latin america for launching our trade show so a very short break five minutes our next speaker is already with us so just for you to grab a cup of water or coffee and uh, please enjoy the videos okay from Alaska and from Seafood Show Latin America. Thank you.
immensity, synonym of greatness, abundance, endless water, ocean. That translates diversity, cultures, differences, and the whole. That represents the diversity of seafood market and every type of existing species, fish, self shellfish and seafood, from harvest to farming, domestic or imported. Immensity, a word that goes together with business generation, land of a growing diverse offer and one of the world's largest consumers, Latin America is the perfect place to welcome the major stakeholders of this immensity, seafood buyers and sellers from the whole world. Frank Alfeiras and Seafood Brazil partnered to feature seafood show Latin America, an event that is born aligned with global trade and in sync with the adoptions of creative and technological solutions for the largest animal protein market worldwide. An immersion experience in the vast world of the most sustainable business in this planet with the Latin touch. We are the difference, the wealth of what is key, the details that improve the whole. We are Seafood Show Latin America, where your seafood hooks up the market. Hello, everyone. We'll now continue our program. So the pace is doing very, it's going very well. Now we're going to introduce our next guest. We expect our meeting to last another hour and a half. We have very interesting presentations and this is the second panel called Innovation, Competitiveness and Marketing. We are going to talk about successful cases. And in this panel, the previous panel actually, we analyze global aspects and of trade, also raw materials. I think we learned a lot from the first half of our meeting. And now we will focus on a topic that we haven't explored a lot yet, which are some market innovations in processing, in methodology, and also in establishing new businesses with regional and international partners. And talking about that in this program that specializes in the seafood industry, of course, we needed to hear from someone from Spain, a very innovative market. Our next guest will be live from Galicia. His name is Julian Rodriguez Suarez, and he's responsible for the research and development department of Nueva Pesca Nova, previously known as Pesca Nova, that also operates in Brazil. We will now continue in Spanish. Good afternoon, Julian. I don't know if you can hear me. Yes. Oh, hi, Ricardo. How are you? Good afternoon. I'm perfect. As I mentioned, I'm still waiting for my baby eels. For those that don't know the baby eels, they are delicious. But in reality, today our focus will be, will be innovation and specifically Surimi. Well, Spain is one of the countries that most consumes sea seafood, not only fresh, but a process with added value products. And from the technical point of view, I would like you to provide us more information regarding this profile of process programs that are of added value, that are Surimi, and how can we, how can we learn how, we, how can we use this in our countries? As you know, there are a number of countries from Latin America participating, and we have over 260 people participating live. And now 
I would like to tell everyone that this presentation will be available in YouTube in three languages. So, so if for some reason you weren't able to follow the presentation in live, you can go to YouTube, okay? So Julian, uh, could you please? Could you please begin? You have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ricardo. So, well, good morning or good afternoon, whatever, wherever you are, right? So first and foremost, I would like to thank Ricardo, Carolina, Asmi for giving me this opportunity and to be able to share with you this moment. I hope that it, it is interesting to you. A slight introduction of Pescanova Group. This is a group, well, probably it's known, but just a background. This is a company that is founded in 1960. It captures and harvests, it processes and trades products and it's one of the very few multinationals that is present in all the value chain. In reality, the Nova Pescanova trades products that come from the sea in 80 countries in five continents. And in 2019, the revenue must was 1 billion 57 euros. We have several thousand employees. We are present in four continents. And of course, we carry out a variety of activities. We have the culture of prawn, 54 million tons a year. Well, uh, this is what we do. We're going to go on speaking about surimi, the products using surimi as raw material, and the experience of Pescanova in the use of surimi uh, with the obtention of the raw material from Alaska. Now, in 1998, we began at the very turn of the 20th century. And at that point in time, it is true that what we had were the crab sticks, the uh, karikama in sticks, of course. And at that moment, we asked ourselves, if we could perhaps uh, expand the use of fish in the business, if it would be interesting or not to perhaps uh, delve into this type of business. Once again, we began in 1998 with the crab sticks. We also worked with a frozen product and the business began to grow throughout the years. It helped a great deal to uh, have the uh, differentiation that we had because the frozen products could come from anywhere in the world, but the refreshed products had to be manufactured domestically. And this is what gave us a boost now, in terms of products, evidently we have the crab sticks as the ones that you see on the screen. This uh, also uh, is sold in the refresh format. I think that this is what has made us very popular. Now, the refresh format has a lifespan of approximately 45 days. So everything began with the crab sticks and we began to increase our variety. Another very famous product are the Angula steel eels, a product that is highly appreciated in Spain it is a product fabric manufactured with surimi. And uh, well, these were the main beginnings that we had. Of course, we have had several other products as, as part of our innovation. Um, I would like to make a pause and say that although 
uh, Nueva Pesca Nova is a multinational company and is present in several countries. At that point in time, we did not have the uh, capacity to have sufficient supply of raw material. We had to depend on suppliers for raw material. And this is when we came into contact with a surimi from Alaska. Now, why the surimi from Alaska? when it comes to developing products, a very important point is the stability of the product. And Alaska has been uh, working with extremely good fishery management. The consistency and the quality of the raw material is very important when it comes to offering stable quality. We have a good foundation for the development of products and something that has become ever more relevant and that is more important for the consumer is the issue of sustainability. Now, if we bring together these three variables, the stability of supply, the quality and stable quality, of course, and sustainability, proven sustainability, this is something that presently you can only find in the region of Alaska. Now, uh, I would now like to share information with you in terms of the development of the products based on surimi as a raw material. Now we use surimi, the raw material, as simply another ingredient when we're manufacturing the crab sticks. It is a mixture of different products, one of which, of course, is the surimi coming from Alaska. I would like to underscore this because although it is true and fundamental, of course, to have a quality raw material. Another important part is the user who is going to use the raw material in a quality product. So we have the importance of the supplier of the ingredient and at the other end, the user of that ingredient, which is the fisherman. Now, there are two fundamental paths, a path that we could call continuous evolution. Uh, for example, when we're speaking about crab sticks and others, and we have another path which tends to be more disruptive, where we think outside of the box, uh, something that goes beyond what has already been described in that first line, that of evolution for the development of products. I think that Pescanova thinks that it is relevant to work with an ever more reduced list of ingredients, to work with uh, very few ingredients to work without preservatives to maximize the fish content in the products. And all of this is thanks to a continuous product and a process enhancement process for years. There's a very interesting point here. And I'm going to move away a bit from this script. We uh, also have a certain ad hoc development of products for the market. And when Carolina asked me to make this presentation today, I thought to myself, well, how is Caricama, which uh, would be the Caricama or the crab stick that the people in Brazil and Argentina or Peru will like? What is it that we would have to do? Which are the tweaks in the recipe that we have to make to adapt the taste to the preferences of each different region? And well, this is what you could do. The raw material allows us to do this now from the other viewpoint, although we 
these are commodities, these scrap sticks are commodities. Now, through the process of evolution, we can begin to think about which would be the ideal stick in terms of organolectic properties for the end consumer. The other path of work, of development, is the path of disruption. And what we have decided here is to seek new moments of consumption. In Spain, for example, the crab sticks basically are used in salads. This is the main use and salads in Spain, of course, are one of the more consumed dishes, uh, consumed with a great deal of frequency. When we think of the Angula steel eels, fundamentally these products are consumed warm and they take us to another moment of consumption. We're speaking about a dinner, a special meal, a celebration. And this is where the challenge lies. What can we do? Which are the products that we can develop to focus ever more on these moments of consumption for a larger number of people, not only salads and celebrations or the Angula steel eels at Christmas or special occasions. And year after year, this is how we have been working and carrying out new developments. Of course, we can do much more than the consumer can imagine or understand. Well, this is fish. Is this a snack perhaps? And there is some work that we have to do in terms of educating the consumer to show them all the positive aspects of sudimi as a raw material, to show them the combination of sudimi with other ingredients. And there are many opportunities and we're working towards finding good solutions for these opportunities. It is not simple to launch new products but to work with Surimi is a good foundation for this development. And it enables us to come to a greater variety to make or launch products that are made with fish. Does. Uh, mean that we work with core ingredients, for example, the sticks traditionally, and they have to be nutritionally perfect. And in terms of organolectic properties, they have to be adapted to each customer. Basically, they have to be customized. I don't want to have to go on. There's a great deal more of information, but I am at your disposal for questions. Thank you very much. That was an excellent presentation. Here in Brazil, there is significant consumption of canicama in the meat restaurants. When it comes to the salads, uh, you prepare a salad to eat with the meat and canicami is quite consumed. I have a question and we have a question from the public as well. The question? is every time I go to Spain, I'm absolutely impressed with the incredible variety of fish, of raw material that you have in those fairs. And this is a very traditional market. Now, my question is, if it, if it is a challenge to develop so many uh, processed products in a large and traditional market such as Spain, uh, which are your comments therefore regarding this? The idea of course is to make the consumer's life easier and society has been 
changing significantly through the years, people working outside of home more and more, people uh, have to eat outside, people do not know how to cook, but it seems that this is changing at present because of the economic and pandemic situation. We're recovering our cooking skills and we have to offer an easy, convenient product that is boneless, of course. And what we have to do is to maximize the use. And this is the responsibility that we have as creators of the recipe, maximize the fish content, take away whatever is not absolutely necessary to manufacture the product. And of course, the end result is to have a satisfied customer. This is very important. Thank you. Now we have an additional question, but I would like to give the floor to Carolina so she can help us with this last question. It seems she has her own remarks as well. Yes, it's true. Hello, Julian, welcome. Uh, uh, it is true, some people are asking us what surimi is and what the crab sticks are. Julian, could you share this with us? What is the difference? I realize that, of course, in 10 minutes, this is a great deal of information and I might have gone very quickly. Now, surimi per se as raw material, as an ingredient, is what we purchase from Alaska. It is the fillet of the fish that we have chopped up in a specific way. And uh, this makes it possible to preserve the characteristics of the fish protein included in the fish and enables us to develop and manufacture our products. That is the surimi as raw material. It comes from frozen fish uh, in, to say it very clearly. Now at the other end where we are as users, as product developers, we use this ingredient, this fish block, and we use it to develop a variety of different products. It is simply one more ingredient in our process. And fundamentally, it is the raw material that contributes with the natural fish proteins. Now, depending on the type of product and on the customer requirements, of course, we can work with different uh, surimi percentages as a raw material once again. Very good, it's always so good to speak to you, Julian. You're always very clear. Now, uh, it was said that Julian is one of the only experts in food development using fish products. And this has surprised me because here in Brazil, we're under the impression that all of the experts are there in Spain, but the situation mustn't be easy. Well, this is somewhat anecdotal when, well, my children now are older, but when my child was very small, she was five years old, she would be asked in school, what does your father do? What does your father work in? And I told her, you see these five fingers, there aren't five in Spain that have the job that I have. And this is one of the difficulties that we have had compared to Asia. Once again, we began in 1998 with the development. This was the year that I joined the company. And in Spain, there are three 
manufacturers of products that are made with surimi. We have Pescanova, we have Arinaga, Aguinaga and Bichunai. But at the university, of course, I didn't study any of this. And at that time, without internet, without YouTube, without any of this technology, we did have to learn by doing, by experimenting. And the world of Surimi is a tiny universe, of course, uh, suppliers in Alaska and then manufacturers. There aren't that many options. Well, on my behalf, I would like to thank you very much. I hope that we can keep in touch with the company and with yourself, of course. I will now give the floor to Carolina. Thank you very much once again. Thank you, thank you, Julian. It has been a pleasure. Okay, now I'm back to Portuguese. Let's change the channels. What I would like to say about Surimi and Julian's presentation is that we naturally associate Surimi to, can, to uh, crab kanikama as we use in sushi or in salads, but what else could we develop? Maybe fish snacks? I think that we have room for innovation and we know that in our region, we need to create new products and new ways of consuming fish. And maybe surimi is a good product to, for us to do that. So now I would like to comment about our next presentation. We will talk about what is still missing, salmon, the wild salmon from Alaska. I would like to invite Guilherme Blanqui, the director of Noronha Pescados. Noronha Pescados is a partner of the Alaska Seafood Market Institute since the beginning of its operations in Brazil. And Guilherme was one of the first people to bet on sustainable products and to develop a full line of products for Alaska salmon, such as wild salmon, and he also recently opened a new category for Brazilians that are products that were made from Pollock blocks that we saw being explored in China and the Netherlands. And we would like to hear his experience about the introduction of this product in Brazil. Guilherme, can you hear me? Hello, Carol. Hello. Welcome. I would like to thank you for the invitation to participate in this session where we can exchange information and experiences from people from all over the world, those who are that who deal with um, seafood products. Thank you for accepting my invitation. So now I will hand over to you so that you can deliver your talk. As you mentioned before, Noronha has existed for the last 50 years. We are headquartered in Recife in the state of Pernambuco. We started our operations with seafood products. And in the beginning, we realized in the first 10 years of our operations, we realized that this state was not very promising to develop our fishing activities. And this is why we migrated to processing and purchasing raw materials from other regions in the country and to process these products in our plant in Recife. At the end of the year 2000, we built another plant in 2008, actually. And this is when we began expanding our line of products. We've always been concerned with the supply of raw materials. We've always been very careful about that and in the plans that we had for our company. We are constantly pursuing high quality products that can be sourced with regularly and sustainably. 
we are constantly pursuing sustainability. That's a concern that we had all over the world. But back then in Brazil, this was just beginning. So we source products from several regions and Alaska drew our attention. This is back in the time when ASME opened their office here in Brazil. So Noronha is located in the state of Pernambuco, Brazil, has existed for over 50 years, over 3000 clients in food service and retail. We have grown strongly every year, especially because of the line of Alaska products. We also operate with diversification of fish products so we of seafood so we have also lobsters shellfish and other seafood products shrimps and this helps us vary our product mix we also achieve several certifications such as MSC, ASC, and our main client niche are chains of supermarkets, distributors, and food services across the country. So that's the history of Noronha. Next slide, please. And this is the background about Alaskan fish products. So we started this interest in 2011. We started uh, working with Alaska Seafood in back then. And we started a project with certification because we didn't have certification standards for the sustainability for some products in Brazil. And we started this pro project with certain certification agencies in Brazil. That project took a few years until it became consolidated. And only in 2014, we were able to launch our uh, Alaskan fish products with wild salmon, cod, and pollock. In the next slide, you see how we began and then the packages were improved. And in 2019, we started working with Pollock. And in 2021, we launched a product. We're bringing the raw fish from Alaska to uh, Portugal. And then these are turned into fish balls and being brought to Brazil. So we have the high quality of Alaskan products with the tradition of Portugal so that we can process these products and provide a premium product that Brazilians are very used to and that they enjoy purchasing. Uh, so here you see the first packages that we worked with. It is, we wanted to promote sustainability and wanted customers to see the, the product. We show that this product comes from Alaska, that is sustainable. So we display all the assurances that are behind even ASMIS work. In 2017, we developed new packages. So here you see the new packages we use with the new standard. And that type of package had to do with the waters from Alaska, the landscape of Alaska, and the quality was differentiated. The product was could, could be clearly seen by the consumers. They could perceive the benefits that Alaska products bring in terms of freshness and quality. And in 2019, we also developed a very innovative project. It was a very first company in Brazil to launch products based on Pollock blocks. This is used for all products and for a battered uh, products and different products as we saw from our colleague from the Netherlands. This is a very versatile product that is gaining more momentum in Brazil. Right now we're facing this barrier that consumers are not familiar with this product. Maybe they do not foresee all the possibilities in terms of preparation. So we need to create more recipes, and teach our consumers on how to produce and how to prepare these products that can be prepared in so many ways. It's a new product. This has gained an interesting market share in our country. 
and more recently we launched this cod line it is recently launched right before uh, passover and for easter and this is also very interesting for us i'd also like to highlight some points that were very important in this development i think it's important to, to talk about them of course we faced some difficulties in the beginning in brazil we faced competition of products that had water added to it so that it would seem um, heavier and that problem remained for many years and only when this problem stopped is that we had the opportunity of move forward in our developments there was a change in how imported processed sea products seafood products were was changed that when glazing issue was removed from the equation and this is only then that the brazilian industry had more opportunities to develop and grow this has been crucial for the growth of noronha but not only for us but for other companies in brazil as well i think that now we have a different situation in our industry and of course another important aspect has to do with the variations in the dollar exchange rate, something we cannot easily predict. But everyone in this business has to deal with that and protect ourselves some way. Regarding the sales of seafood products from Alaska and Brazil, we see some competitive advantages of processing these uh, products in brazil so they are harvested in alaska they are sent in containers to seattle then shipped to brazil and here they are processed and then distributed so you mentioned an option of processing products like that in peru there was also a project in the netherlands to distribute products from there and adding value to them this is also something we are developing value-added products and also the development of markets such as china so i see that in the upcoming years brazil will grow a lot in the production and processing of raw materials that come from alaska this is where you can get stable products with good competitive advantage so I see that Brazil will use more important products, more raw material from Alaska and to develop products such as commodities. But I think that most commonly we're going to turn them into value added products. Great. Thank you, Guilherme. I have just some comments. Once again, I'd like to encourage you to send us your questions using our Zoom chat box. We have a question from Marcos. So he's asking about a salmon. So how do you see the salmon market in the short and in the mid term, perhaps even in the long term? But I also have a question to you. So how do you see the market for wild salmon in Brazil? I think that for some people, it's difficult for them to see the possibility of having both. So how can you put together farmed and wild salmon? Well, the major factor that has impact on that is FX, a foreign exchange, and also demand and supply. And what we see is that Brazilians are consuming more salmon. It's the most important species that we find in Asian restaurants. And we see that uh, there was a sharp increase and we believe that we really invested rightly on salmon. We bet on salmon. If 
particularly considering what other competitors did, and that certainly opened new opportunities to us. And obviously, there are some uh, fluctuations of the exchange rate and some other factors, but I believe that that market will grow. And um, consumers will also look for sustainable products, wild products. And I'm not saying that this will replace uh, salmon from Chile because we know that we face some challenges. The salmon from Alaska faces logistic challenges. The fact that it's uh, we will get it frozen, but I think that uh, Alaska salmon presence or market share is increasing a very significant pace. I fully agree with you. I don't think you have to choose one or the other. And I think that there is room for that. We have another question from Alexander. As an industry, perhaps you can answer that. Is there much difference between the quality of processed products processed in China vis-a-vis -vis those processed in Peru? I think you can answer that question. Is there any difference considering the raw material from Alaska? We also import products from Peru. We also imported many products from China a few years back. There is a difference. There is a difference in terms of standards. Um, there, I think the difference was bigger in the past. I think today is more standardized. What I products I see coming from China today follows the same processing standards from other markets, such as Peru overall, maybe with a few exceptions. But I think that overall, we have seen products with good quality. But in the past, we faced a lot of difficulties with that. We had problems with the quality of products that came from China. And this had to do also with the improvement in the national industry. But this problem was overcame. And I hope that from now on, competition will continue at the same level. I mean, everyone and on the same pace and on the same level. And then we can find our spaces, but with fair competition. Perfect, I agree with you. Guilherme, it is a pleasure counting on you. There are several questions from here in the Q&A. And unfortunately, we need to move on because we have other guests but I will share with him all questions. So Guilherme, once again, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. It was very, this is a very good event. Congratulations. And I hope that we can discuss more about seafood industry in Brazil and also to share more uh, new things have been developing. I'm, I'm very optimistic. I would like to leave you with a very optimistic message, not only related to the Alaska seafood industry, but also to the seafood industry in Brazil. I think it's a very important time for us. We are finding more space and people are consuming more seafood products from Brazil. And I hope that we can also get more investments and also support from the government. And the seafood industry in Brazil is not does not get a lot of support from the Brazilian uh, government. There is support to fishing activity. So the fishing department does a good job, but they should see industry as the link between producers and the end consumer market. So, so there's always the industry between uh, the fishermen and the plate of our consumers. And we also generate a lot of jobs. So now, in the pandemic times, this is important. It's important to have some incentive policies for the seafood industry in Brazil, like there 
are in other countries because this could lead us to generate even more uh, jobs. I agree with you and I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I like this connection you've just made to this topic. David's presentation from Peru, the work that they have made with SNI in Peru to improve their market and how the industry and the processing industry have worked together to approve some laws. So this is important. And I think that's something we lack in Brazil and in other countries as well. This is just one example, but there's also a generation of new jobs, taxes, and that's the industry that is going to bring, for example, this raw material and so that it can reach the uh, table of our consumers. So there's something to be done there. So we have a lot to grow and with the support of the government, we can expedite that. So thank you once again, and I hope I can I could have helped you and I'm open to other future opportunities. Thank you. So now, before I start to give a talk, I'd like to invite Valeska to take it over again. Valeska, are you out there? Okay, you need to unmute yourself. Uh, you know what? I was laughing. I really enjoyed your chat, but thank you very much, Carolina and uh, an excellent presentation. And that's perfect for us to start our third session, retail consumption and B2C marketing, selling in international markets. So retailers are really shifting the paradigm in selling seafood during the pandemic. We know that there was a huge pressure on grocery stores and in order to meet consumers' demand. And frozen seafood is becoming more and more consumed. There is also a demand for health ability, sustainability, convenience. And in order to address this issue, I'd like to invite Marcos Galvão. He is a commercial commercial manager of seafood at Pão de Açúcar Group, part of the Casino Group. Hello, Marcos, can you hear me? Let's see if he can hear us, Marcos. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, now I can. Great, thank you so much, Marcos, and welcome. Thank you so much. I heard of this discussion. I apologize for wearing a mask, but I am at our office and we need to comply with all uh, sanitary requirements. Yes, we are doing the same over here in order to hold this online but safe event. Yes, it's online, but uh, the content is very rich. That's what's most important. So, Vanessa, I'd like to start by thanking you, Ricardo, Carolina, for this invitation, especially for giving me the opportunity to share the retail perspective about frozen seafood, Alaska seafood. And the idea is to share content that uh, can help you all. I will address four topics in my presentation. So let me start by talking about the company we present, the GPA, and then I'm gonna address seafood market according to our standpoint, considering everything that happened in 2020 and this whole year of a pandemic. And then what we did in order to leverage uh, sales of this category. And then some assumptions that I find important in keeping leveraging this product in Brazil. So GPA, the group is present in Brazil and outside Brazil, in Argentina, Colombia, and Uruguay. Next slide, Valesca, please. In these uh, three countries, 
we are represented by the Exito Group, and I'm talking about 630 stores, most of them in Colombia. 515 stores in Colombia, 19 in Uruguay, and 25 stores in Argentina. So you can see a substantial number of stores spread out in South America. Next. Now let's uh, focus on Brazil. So in Brazil, we have a larger number of stores and different channels to communicate with our consumers. In Brazil, we, there are 873 stores, 26 distribution centers and warehouses. We are present in 15 Brazilian states plus the federal district. And here I'm talking about brick and mortar stores. The group has more than 57,000 employees. And we are pioneers in e-commerce in Brazil, food e-commerce. And that has really increased with the pandemic. And we are still uh, the leaders. Another important point is that uh, there are more than 21 million enrolled in our CRM uh, base. So 10% of the Brazilian consumer, we get to know what they buy, how they buy, and many other pieces of information from using our CRM database. Our brands in Brazil, 182 Pão de Açúcar stores. We have also extra hypermarket, 103 stores, extra supermarket, six stores. And this brand is now, um, moving to Mercado Extra, which, and we have 141 of Mercado Extra. We also have the Comprebem brand with 28 stores. And as for convenience stores, we have Minuto Pão de Açúcar with 86 stores and Mini Mercado with 150 stores. We are also present in the drugstore segment and gas stations. So altogether, we have more than 700 point of sales. When we go over the seafood landscape in Brazil, frozen seafood, what we've learned since last year is the following. Brazilians have always made clear that they prefer fresh seafood. And uh, Brazilians even bought fresh seafood and then froze the product themselves, but that is the trend. But with the pandemic, the cost of fresh seafood increased for different reasons because of uh, FX and many other uh, costs. That allowed new consumers to try frozen seafood. And what's very relevant is that this trade-off between fresh and frozen seafood generated repurchases. Thus, consumers tried frozen seafood and they are buying it again. That means that uh, we really evolved regarding this trend. So what is the likelihood of having this trade-off uh, maintained right now. We believe there is an increased cost of uh, both wild and farmed species. And that's what we believe led to turning to frozen seafood. And Guilherme also mentioned how much the quality of frozen seafood improved. And that certainly also supported this changing consumer behavior. So the consumer bought, realized it's a good product and bought it again. And as for the trade-off, it's also very important to bear in mind that it's easy for consumers to store these products at home. They're spending more time at home and it's very convenient to keep these products in their fridges and freezers. Now let's talk about frozen seafood uh, and our group. 
So what we what we have learned is that uh, frozen seafood segment was already increasing, but since last year, there was an exponential growth in our brick and mortar stores. And as for e-commerce, that growth was above a three digit growth. So in, in 2021, this trend has been maintained. So a very accelerated growth. And we believe that this trend is here to stay. As for our brick and mortar stores, we are concerned about segmenting the assortment. So to have the right product at the right store. So out of the brands I mentioned, and that we offer to our consumers in the different stores, we meet the needs of different consumers. And as for frozen products, we understood we had to segment of them. So we have uh, consumers who buy the entire fish because it costs less, as well as those who buy just the fillets. Another important point is the shelf planning. And that's important in order to ensure that uh, we reduce friction. So we have been trying to simplify our point of sales with uh, fewer brands in order to help consumers in their choices. And we believe that today less is more. Next. E-commerce, this is a channel that uh, really skyrocketed. And uh, it left a very important legacy after the beginning of this pandemic. And it's strategic because it's very flexible. It's very easy for us to activate promotions. Here are two examples from Noronha. We have the cod filet from Alaska and uh, frozen and uh, frozen salmon from Alaska. This is available at Pão de Açúcar and Extra. And if I need to delete this promotion, that can be done very easily. And as for e-commerce, we can also have a store in store. So we can have a store of that supplier inside our website. We can also have uh, some flash promotions that will last for one hour, let's say, in our website. Now, in addressing our strategies regarding our social media, we do benefit and use social media in order to communicate with consumers, in order to provide the knowledge, to share recipes. This is broadly used as well as to also receive their feedback. One more. So here, we have uh, our apps in order to promote our products. Here are two examples of what we do. So on Fridays, we have we offer 20% or any other type of discount at the extra. And in Pão de Açúcar stores, we also offer discount from Friday to Sunday in sushi cuts. And we can activate these massive promotions, use our brands, or customize promotion according to that specific consumer habit. So we do make a great use of this channel. And in closing, I'd like just to share our standpoint on what we can do together, the industry and retailers in order to consolidate frozen seafood, be it national or from Alaska, to bring that to Brazilians table. We need to start by determining the assortment of what product we want to work with, but segmenting it. So which, is, which group are you going to target? So if it's for the upper classes, if that's the case, we will offer special cuts, small portions, ready to eat products 
differentiated and sustainable products. And I think that products from Alaska, they do fit this cluster very well. If your product targets uh, the lower income consumer, then we're talking about uh, HGs, uh, whole fish and other types of cuts. I think that that's the first assumption for us to start working with frozen seafood. It's also very important to have an impeccable execution every single day at point of sales. And I think that the industry also should participate in providing promoters at stores. That's very important. And the industry and retailers should invest on marketing, both on brick and mortar stores, as well as on online uh, or e-commerce channels using influencers. I'd like to highlight influencers. I believe that right now, influencers are very important for the digital world and even at point of sales, brick and mortar stores, we cannot offer tastings right now. And I believe that influencers can certainly help us in sharing their opinion, in leveraging the brands. Another important point, we need to change our mindset of employees that work at fish counters. They are usually driven to sell fresh products because they will receive a cut of that sales. But I think it's important that we really work in order to change the mindset of our employees at fish counters. And this is also improving. Another point that represents a major challenge is a code, coaching. Pieces of equipment have uh, improved, but we need to also consider that we have improved, for example, in the amount of water in the product, but we have such cool products. We have products with great packaging, but if the code chain does not work, that may blemish your brand. Another important opportunity is to have your own brand. When we think about seafood in Brazil, consumers today do not relate that to any specific brand. So for us retailers, that represents an opportunity in order to develop our own brand. And just to close, e-commerce is the channel that can certainly consolidate everything that was addressed because of its reach and flexibility in order to activate promotions. That's what I like to share with you. Here you find my contact information. Once again, thank you very much for allowing me to share retailers standpoint. Thank you, Marcos. Thank you very, very much. Very rich content. We know that uh, we don't have much time, but I think that you were right on the spot. And we have many questions, but unfortunately, I'll have to choose some of them. So first question, and you even touched on that, talking about special cuts. So what is your take regarding trends and uh, what kind of diversification should retailers present to consumers? I think that uh, when it comes to seafood in Brazil, we evolved substantially over the last couple of years. And the pandemic has also left a very important legacy. It's important that we run some surveys, some studies in order to understand what consumers want. In the past, the industry would develop the product and consumers had just to accept that. Otherwise, the industry would take some steps back. But what are we doing at Pound and Sucker Group? We have an area called commercial development. And the idea is to work in a close relationship with the industry to understand what consumers want and then share that with the industry to discuss that. 
So what we see today is that today we have some consumers that want to buy the whole fish, even uh, not uh, gutted. And we have uh, consumers that are willing to buy that. Now, in the Pão de Açúcar Group, which is a high-end grocery store, then we have consumers who want a smoked product, a breaded product, smaller portions, a new species, that a product that they can afford. But this will work only if we share these stories with consumers. So today, the major challenge we face is the following. We talk to the industry, we determine a very nice portfolio aligned to what service share, but once that product hits point of sales, we fail in listening or in having the consumer perception about that product. So just in closing, what we have internally, this commercial development department tries to fill that gap working with new species, new cuts, new products. We run some small trials and we listen to consumers. We want to have their perception. And I even tell suppliers that they could use our stores as labs. Just run some small trials, make adjustments based on what consumers tell them, their feedback. I firmly believe in that. So ideas emerge, but we need to run some small trials. And another point I find important, that's my personal view. We should not look to what Europe is doing and try to replicate that here in Brazil. Obviously, there are many cool, nice things going on in Europe, but we need to run a small trial in Brazil to see if that works. Exactly, we're talking about different group of consumers Cultural different. Yes, just if you think about the capital city of Sao Paulo, you have different groups, different groups of consumers. If you go to the coast of Sao Paulo, it's a different group. The inner part of Sao Paulo, different group. And that's why I really highlighted the importance of segmenting the products. Thank you, Marcos. We do have some other questions, but uh, I will we will actually forward these questions to you so that you can answer them later on. So thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and for your time spending spent here with us. Thank you, Valeska. I'd like to thank you and please feel free to call me to invite me. I will, I will always try to support you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcos. Yes, thank you. Wow, so many questions. I apologize for not having had the opportunity to ask all of them, but do keep sending us your questions. So now I will invite Carolina once again so that she can continue with the next panel. Carolina? I'm back. So Marcos, thank you for your great presentation. I'd like to thank the audience for their engagement. There's so many questions, but we will answer them later. Okay, now I'm going to change to a different language again. And let me remind you, for those who have just joined us, we have simultaneous interpretation available. So please select the language you prefer to hear using the Zoom interpretation button bar. Back, and uh, I just, uh, before proceeding to the next presentation, I'd like to remind you that we are offering interpret simultaneous interpretation services. So please select your language in the bottom bar and the Zoom application on your Google, your laptop, your computer. Okay. So the next, I guess, our next speaker is in the US. And uh, I would like to to Craig Morris. He's the CEO of the Genuine Alaska Polo, the Producers Association, one of the greatest partners of ours. Hi, Craig. Hi there, how are you? Good, so welcome to our Latin American event. Thank you for having me, I'm excited to be here. Yeah, so I'm asking Craig to share a little bit with us about uh, his experience in promoting seafood in the U.S., more specifically about uh, the seafood in the U.S. retail. So, Craig, thank you so much for accepting our invitation, and uh, please feel free to share your slides and uh, yeah, share with us.
us your experience in the American market. Thank you very much for having me. Let's see if uh, technology will be our friend today. I will uh, try to pull up my slides. Do they work? Yeah, working perfectly. Outstanding. Today we get to talk about my favorite topic, which is Wild Alaska Pollock. When I came to the Genuine Alaska Pollock producers in January of 2019, we had two issues that we wanted to address with our fish. First, it, it was awareness. Um, even though our product was in market and had outstanding penetration, uh, most consumers were not aware that the fish that they were enjoying was wild Alaska pollock. It was hidden behind that better breading. Uh, it was an ingredient in a variety of other things, up to and including surimi, uh, but there was just not good familiarity of the fish itself. The second thing that we wanted to address is our limited channel penetration. Uh, we have great penetration in the frozen food aisle at retail, and we have great penetration in the quick service restaurants as a a core menu item. So to address those two vulnerabilities for our industry, first we did research on how to introduce Alaska Pollock most effectively so that we could build demand for fish, but then also invest in partnerships so that we could expand uh, U.S. Alaska Pollock's penetration outside of just the retail frozen food aisle and the quick service restaurants. Well, as we all know, about a year ago, right now, COVID happened. And so what we're going to talk about today is what we did at GAP in partnership with ASME, what we're doing now, what's on our to-do list. Obviously, QSRs or the quick service restaurants had their own set of challenges that we could spend uh, the time talking about, but I've been asked to talk about uh, what happened in retail. Quite simply, uh, the U.S. and international frozen food aisle uh, was the right place to be during COVID. As I said, when I came to GAP, our objective was to expand our footprint out of that category. And yet, during COVID, it was the best category to be. And there's lots of numbers. All of us know that the frozen food aisle uh, was really where a lot of people were stocking up. Uh, I included, uh, bought a larger freezer. And so, like many people around the world, more and more people basically have a cold storage system for our industry in their homes. We have the opportunity to move things in a greater volume. Uh, so these are some of the obvious numbers, but it, at the end of the day, the, the fact that we really focus on is those Gen Z consumers, those high earning millennial households with children, those were our, our target audience receive. Uh, those are the people that believe in the health messaging. They believe in the sustainability story. They love the Providence story of Alaska. Those are the ones that we really wanted. And for the first time ever, they came to the frozen food aisle. And the thing that's really amazing that they found was the frozen food aisle was not the frozen food aisle they remember. Major brands, everybody uh, has really put a lot of energy, thought, research, and investment into the frozen food aisle of retail. So when people got in there during COVID and looked around, they saw plant-based offerings. They saw low-carb offerings. They saw products that not only tasted good and were convenient, but really checked all the boxes for the consumers. People looking for sustainability messages, it was there. People looking for knowing where their food came from, the Providence story, it was there. And so net on net, what we saw during COVID was this sustained growth in not only frozen seafood sales, but once the full service seafood cases opened up, sustained growth in, in fresh seafood as well. And I think that's one of the things that's really important for us to focus on is historically as an industry, we always felt that seafood was something that most people ate away from home because they were concerned that they couldn't cook it well, they wouldn't have a good experience, and frankly, they didn't want to fail at dinner. And so what we found during COVID is not only did people buy more seafood at retail and bring it home to cook it at home than really ever before, they keep doing it. And I think this could be for our industry, but you'll see some of the things that we focused on is increasing per capita consumption for seafood. In the case of Wild Alaska Pollock, increasing overall demand for Alaska Pollock. And if we can get people comfortable eating our fish at home, that's going to give us a whole different set of channels to really focus on for major movement. So as I said, the frozen food aisle was hot, the frozen seafood aisle was hot, and then obviously that had a carryover into the, the full service seafood case. If we look just at frozen seafood, 
sales, we had some pretty amazing uh, developments in that market. Obviously, one of the things that we look for is how are the retailers performing? Are they making money in the departments that our products are in? And overwhelmingly, as you can see at the bottom with Walmart, Lidl, Albertsons, and Stop and Shop, U.S. chains, they made a lot of money during COVID on the frozen seafood phase. They've continued to make money as those sales are still up year over year. And one of the things that will happen then is retailers, when they feel a part of their store is profitable, they put energy into that part of their store. They drive traffic to that part of the store. They try to differentiate their frozen food aisle from the frozen food aisle of their competitor. And that's the perfect storm for us in Alaska Pollock and us in Alaska Seafood. Because now if we have retailers excited about their frozen food aisle, excited about frozen seafood, they're going to put energy into promoting it, energy into updating it, and making sure that consumers have a great experience in trying to drive traffic to it. So I think we've got a, a really great opportunity there in some of these numbers. And it really wasn't just a story that was picked up in the seafood trade. You know, for us kind of geeks that really follow this, it was really followed by mainstream media. In the United States, if you picked up a newspaper, uh, opened up uh, the internet, and, and tried to read some of the stories that were coming online, everybody was reading about how Americans were just eating more seafood sales were truly uh, here to stay. And I think that's one of the things we should be very excited about. So sort of net net, if you look at seafood compared to other commodities, uh, seafood had a heck of a year, especially in the frozen food aisle. Uh, you, we're comparing against commodities, produce, meat, deli departments that have a lot of investment, more investment traditionally than the seafood cakes in the frozen food aisle do. But the real growth has been frankly where our fish is. That's one of the things that we're really excited about and we want to reach out to those partners and make sure that they know we have resources available to them to help sustain that growth and really drive traffic to their stores because this is what consumers more and more are looking for in the grocery shop. So when COVID hit, one of the things that we did at Gap was say, okay, if consumers are at home and we know that they're buying more frozen seafood, more Alaska pollock than ever before, how can we help them? What we, what we identified as the primary need was making sure people knew the full versatility. If they had, for the first time ever, five pound bag of fish sticks in the refrigerator, and they were cooking those for their kids every day as their kids were heading for school at home, the parent was working from home, they needed to do a quick lunch. The last thing we wanted was at the end of COVID for people to say, I never want to have a wild last apollo fish stick ever again. So we worked with very influential food bloggers and influencers like Jesse Friedman to develop uh, versatile recipes, easy, quick to serve recipes for working moms so that people could see that frankly, Alaska Pollock was a very versatile protein that would work very well in a number of different applications. And so to not just look at it as a fish stick, but an ingredient in a taco or an ingredient in a number of other items. We then knew that a lot of consumers were developing much more intricate dishes uh, people were baking bread. People were doing a lot of things they normally didn't do because, frankly, they had more time in the kitchen than they, than they had before. So we partnered with people like James Beard, award-winning Seattle chef, Chef Terry Boudreau, uh, to develop for us some more long-form recipes that people could understand that Alaska Pollock could work well in very intricate dishes that people were doing more and more because it was, frankly, fun to cook and you had nothing else to do. We also wanted people to know that if they saw that recipe and they really liked what they saw and they really bought into the Alaska story, they really bought into our sustainability messaging, our Alaska provenance, our wild caught, all of those messages. We wanted to be able to connect people to the products in the stores. So we launched a where to find feature on our website here in the US so that basically if they saw the story on Instagram, they could go into our bio and they were just one click away finding exactly where that raw, raw ingredient was that the chef was cooking. We then really thought that Alaska, that Alaska Pollock had a great opportunity to expand its presence in food service to the higher end restaurants. So we kicked off what we call a Fast Start program in partnership with ASME to introduce higher end restaurants in that struggling food service industry to our fish as well, making sure that they understood that it was a great option if they were looking for a seafood item. Uh, that they could replace the things that they had pre-COVID. So if we look at our partnerships, these are some examples of the work that we did uh, with uh, Jesse Freeman, uh, the Chef Julie. As you can see, these are very simple dishes that incorporate into 
into like a, a macaroni salad or serrini product or into a very healthy uh, quick option for lunch or dinner uh, while us the pollock fillets and we got that out to consumers we then as i said launched on our website uh, these where to find so if you saw the products that were being used in the recipes uh, you could link back through our bio uh, and then find out exactly where the store was that was closest to you or in the case of some of these items actually just have them delivered to your to your home uh, through amazon or whatever we really believe in a in, in genuine alaska pollock producers and obviously in partnership with asme as well that we have an amazing fish and we have an amazing story behind it so what we continually do at GAP is do nationwide surveys, uh, in not only in the United States, but foreign markets as well, to track how we're doing in increasing familiarity with our fish. As I said, that was one of our primary objectives. What we found this past year during 2020, coming out of COVID, was that 55% of Americans were familiar with Alaska pollock. That means that in the past year from our, our study in 2019, 10 million more Americans were familiar with Alaska pollock than the year before. When we ask those consumers, where have you learned about the fish? They're learning about the fish on the front of pack in those frozen food aisles uh, in the grocery stores. So as our partners are calling out Wild Alaska Pollock by name on the front of pack, consumers are seeing that messaging that's resonating with them. And then we ask them what their perception is of the fish. They have a very strong positive association of Alaska Pollock because of our pillars. We always talk about the fact we're from Alaska, we're wild caught, we're sustainable, mild tasting white fish, which is a great option for people that are looking for that. And we have an unmatched nutrition story that we're really proud of as well. So when we ask consumers how we stack up against the competing white fish, Alaska Pollock has the highest positive association of really any of our competing protein. So overall, you know, those aware of Alaska Pollock are most likely to often purchase it from the frozen food all the grocery store versus quick, for, quick service restaurants than any other sales channel. We knew that and we're working on diversifying that as well. So if you look out there, one of the things that we focus on at GAP is not only doing research uh, to make sure that we understand what about our fish resonates best with consumers, but we also have what we call partnership dollars. We help defray marketing costs up to one to one to bring Wild Alaska Pollock to market in new forms, put it into new channels or associated with influencers. And this list of some of those things that we've done. Uh, we've really gotten excited about getting our product into the snacking category because uh, that is just an uber trend uh, here in the United States and around the world. And so we focus on things like Highliners, Alaska Wild Wings that are an alternative to chicken uh, buffalo wings. Uh, we've been very excited, uh, obviously, to associate with influencers like Martha Stewart or Antoni Porowski or those that carry a lot of followers so that when they talk about Alaska Pollock, we get people hopefully looping back to the Wild Alaska Pollock messaging and learning about our fish all year long. And then obviously, one of the things that's very important to us making sure that we get into those higher end applications as well. So we're really proud uh, to see some of those from the higher end applications focusing on our product. This is just a short list that includes a lot of the retail items because I know we're really focused on retail, but all of the new products in the last two years that have been brought to market due to these partnerships. Uh, it's really for us something we're really proud of. And we think because all of these partners are calling out while well, Alaska Pollock might be, that's really translated into moving that needle in terms of consumer familiarity and a positive association because all of these partners, when they work with us as partners, they're required to utilize our messaging and talk about our fish in the most effective way possible. So in the case of, let's say, a Gordon's fish stick, which is a, a major item here in the States, they're going to talk about that Alaska province. They're going to talk about the wild cod. They're going to talk about sustainability. They're going to talk about that mild taste. And then obviously they're also going to talk about the unmatched nutrition. So this is sort of a rundown of some of the things that we've been doing with these partnerships overwhelmingly. Uh, those have been retail focused, but it's, this list shows there's a few things in here that, that we've done as well in terms of, of uh, fast food. But I would say at the bottom, as you can see, Gordon's, as partners like Gordon's have started calling out while asking Pollock by name, their sales have been up markedly. And so it's not anymore while asking Pollock is a fish that's sort of hidden in plain sight that we sort of assume that people think it's cod or paddock, we really think Wild Alaska Pollock is building a name on its own, and people should be really proud of the protein that they use as a resource. As I talked about, one of the things that we do is develop these toolkits that are the most effective way possible to talk about our fish. So one of the things that you'll see, at least in the U.S. market with our partners, uh, and then one of these examples is actually out of Europe, is that they talk about our exact same terminology. And so we get what's called amplification in the marketplace with consumers. 
if they continually see the same messaging around a commodity, they're going to have that association with the commodity itself. So uh, always talk about the wild story, always talk about the Alaska story, always talk about the sustainability story, talk about the nutrition, and then obviously talk about the mild taste of people to, to make sure that they understand the good tasting product. A couple of examples that we did uh, in retail this year. Uh, obviously, everyone knows that the, the burger trend is, is here to stay. Uh, over half of the American team is ground. And so the burger market is frankly unmatched in terms of scale of really any other protein market. One of the things that we focus on is, is taking a slice of that and, and going, frankly, brass knuckles and saying, if you like burgers, uh, there's a healthier option. There's a more sustainable option. There's an option with a lot better uh, provenance story. Again, the wild and Alaska messaging that ties into it. So we worked with Highliner to bring to market a power packed burger. And again, we're not going out and saying, uh, this is a fishy product. It's a burger. And we want you to enjoy it just like you enjoy your burger, but you can do it a little, a little more guilt free because of all the positives that are associated with that product. And we've been really excited with the placement of the product and how the product has moved. Another product uh, that we're really proud of as well, as I said, it's those Alaska wild wings. Uh, you know, getting into that snacking category is huge. Snacking was, was massive during COVID because we're all kind of stuck in our homes and the, the kitchen would call us. And so our opportunity to have those products in are really, really, um, for us, a very, very strong positive. So where are we going from here? Uh, one of the things that we have to focus on is that increasingly uh, values and consumer buying behavior are becoming intertwined like never before. And so in the, in the former days, you would talk to people about what's important to them. You would never see issues like climate change near as high as they are today. I think the COVID episode has really made everybody think that they need to worry about our environment. And so climate change is increasingly becoming a factor in what's driving consumer behavior. Why that's really important for us is I think one of the things we always thought is that people bought their food because it tasted good. They bought their food because it was convenient and affordable. And they bought, bought their food because they're familiar with it. People in general aren't adventurous in what they eat. Increasingly though, the number four factor is personal values. And that's one of the things that we need to make sure that we're doing is helping consumers understand that buying Alaska Pollock, well, Alaska Pollock matches with their personal values. And I think that's a very important issue for us to continue to hit on. Because one of the things that we're seeing in the US is that more and more the most trendy restaurants out, the Chipotle's, the Panera's, they're actually labeling on the menu the carbon footprint of the foods that they serve. And so it's important for us as an industry to do the research that's required to make sure that consumers understand that if you worry about the environment and you want to make purchasing decisions with your food around your personal values, there's nothing better than Alaska Pollock. So one of the things that we're investing in a gap very heavily is what's called a life cycle assessment so that we can have ISO certified numbers that can show people that our product is on the order of 25 times less impactful on the environment than something like a beef burger and even lower than other seafood options out there, certainly the farms and seafoods, uh, which because our biomass is so sustainable, our biomass is wild, it works out much better from a sustainability perspective in terms of climate. So we like to say that we check not only the traditional four boxes that were always important, taste, convenience, affordability, and familiarity, but now we have the fifth box that's really, I think, critical to consumers, those personal values. So we like to think we check all of the boxes. Well, Oscar Pollock, as I said, checks all the boxes, and I think it's time for us to double down. So what are we doing for the future, especially for the retail? We're going to continue to work on our toolkits to make sure that our messaging is on point with where consumers are, especially in front of pack labeling and retail. We're going, to, we're going to launch a business to business outreach strategy so that we can meet with retailers and make them understand if you're making sustainability commitments, if you're trying to go to zero carbon, our product works really well for you. Frankly, the more Alaska Pollock you sell versus the beef you sell, it's easier for you to make an improvement in the environment. We're going to do a very targeted media strategy to continue to build in the consumer's mind that message that eating wild Alaska Pollock is the best thing that you can do for the environment we have a ridiculously low carbon footprint. We're going to create more chef-to-chef -chef content. Why that's really important is we want people to understand that our fish is versatile and it works on a variety of different applications, not only at retail, but in restaurants as well. And then we're going to invest continually, very heavily, in these partnerships.
partnerships and bringing more wireless compiled to market because we want people to see our product not just in the traditional forms like the fish stick, but in new categories as well. Uh, basically taking out everything that we can from the, from the retailers and helping them understand that we're a partner and trying to drive traffic to their stores. And with that, I'll leave it back. Greg, thank you so much for such a detailed presentation. I had several questions, but I responded to everything. Okay. <laughs> That's amazing. So, actually, uh, I, I still have one question. So, let me ask you. Uh, there are a lot of um, Latin American processors here with us today that are are interested in importing uh, raw material from Alaska, processing their plants and exporting back to the US as a retail product or food service product, doesn't matter. What would be your main recommendation to these players that are trying to break the US market with a new Alaska seafood? Definitely uh, sign up for GAP's newsletters. One of the things that we're going to start publishing quarterly is a trends report. What's going on in the retail market in the U.S.? Uh, what are the not just um, uh, sort of minute by minute trends, but truly mega trends? I think the most important thing that we've learned in trying to bring new products to market is not only that you need to bring dollars to the table, and that's what the GAP partnership program does. Those are those dollars. If, if, if companies in Latin America are looking to market their products at retail in the U.S., GAP partnership dollars are available to them. But then also make sure that your products are on trend what we found from our partners is that they want to make sure that when they have new product offerings, that those, those product offerings are really things that people are looking for. Uh, shelf space, especially frozen and refrigerated space, is very valuable. And they want to know that they're going to make turns out of that particular space that they have. And so addressing the trends that consumers have for us is the most important thing. Amazing. Thank you so much for that. And uh, yeah, again, that's pretty much that. We have other questions here, but I'll put everything together and send to you after the event. And uh, uh, I'll be committed to respond to all our participants' questions. So, again, thank you so much for being here with us today. Very interesting presentation. Thank you for having me. Bye. Bye. Okay. Let's keep going in English because uh, my friend Ricardo will help me with the next presentation. Right, Ricardo? That's right, Carolina. Hope you were fine. Hope everyone is not tired. We have a final presentation, and we have a very, very special guest. She's also live from China. Now I would like to welcome Ms. Sofia Yan, presenting Chimpo.com. She's a platform dedicated to provide safe and healthy foods for middle and high end consumers. So, um, is there Sophia with us? Yeah. Hi, Sophia. Thank you. Yeah, here. I'm here. Hello. Good morning. Hello, Sophia. Uh, Thank you for being with us. It's so late. You're back home, right? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you right. enough for that. Yeah, I uh, just want to even. Okay. Thank you. Well, um, as I was saying, Sophia has more than 10 years experience with the fresh foods and food industry, and she acts as a senior director with Jumbo.com. She has traveled to many countries across the world, participating in exchanges, studying other markets, and establishing friendly relations with the fresh food So today she will talk about the challenges of establishing a seafood e-commerce corporation in a continental country, uh, which is China, eager for seafood purchased online. So e-commerce uh, will be our main target here. Right, Sophia, how are you? Uh, I'm fine. So I'm ready to you, I think. Okay. So, can you hear? Hi. It's great Hi. to see you. Great to see you, too. Yeah, so. Uh, I think in my presentation, so I share it back here. Okay. Yeah, it's working. Okay, cool. So, um, I'd like to talk quickly about 
you know, um, e-commerce here. My company is very a good example for e-commerce for for us to understand e-commerce. Actually, Chimbo is a Chimbo is a new retail platform for natural and healthy food for both online and offline business. Uh, with headquarters in Beijing branch in Shanghai, delivered to the whole country, Chimbo delivers premium products through cold chain logistics to our customers in Beijing, Shanghai, Wuxi, and Changzhou. Uh, and room temperature food, vegetables, and fruits have reached other major cities in China. The food offered on Chimbo are guaranteed to be natural and healthy as possible. Uh, Alaska seafood was on the most popular seafood, was one of the most popular seafood on our platform before. Um, things changed a little bit during the COVID-19. So uh, we perform tests for every product on the molecular level at our state of art laboratory. Trimble Lab also issued for safety control reports for every product. Um, for our customer reference. If you launch the app of Trimble, you can see uh, the report of all the products sold on that platform, which was tested, which was done according to Trimble standards. Sophia. So, yeah. You hear me? Hello. Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm, I'm very sorry for that, but can you please uh, put your presentation on the presentation mode for us to have a, you know, a big picture? Uh, okay. Sorry. Please, I'm sorry to interrupt. I no, no, no problem. Uh, can you say now? No, it's still small. Uh, let me uh, hold up. Okay. You, you can click on the fourth icon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At the I... bottom bar. Diverse. 
certified online cooking demo class, we teach the customers how to cook, and then they can buy the ingredients online and share and prepare at home with their uh, with their family. So for many newcomers in the Chinese food industry, we work with a cross-diversity platform is crucial in positioning their products in the competitive market space. So we work with uh, consumers associated with different embassies and locations and uh, from different countries. So so to support our flyers, people who organize same events to promote food products so as to boost the customers' awareness and demands for our products. Our food delivery is also delivered by our holding company, which Paris with durable ice pack, keeping the food for hours. So um, because, you know, also care about the healthy food, the well-being of our suppliers and work side by side to develop the market for healthy food in China. We also apply this model to Alaska product. We organize online uh, cooking class and uh, uh, online special influencer uh, events and activities for them to prepare the ingredients and uh, fish with Alaska uh, fish and other seafood ingredients and share and post in their WeChat account and uh, social media to, with a link of, uh, of the products to promote them among the consumers. That is a basic way for uh, e-commerce promotion here. And also, and um, for, for the business model, you know, if you order online today, you can get a delivery the next day. And also there is express delivery if you order uh, online, you can get your delivery within two hours. So, um, how we after the COVID-19, The number of monthly active users of members in commerce apps have shown that the outburst of COVID-19 has resulted in a disruptive increase of the number of users of Chinese fresh e-commerce platforms during January and February in 2020. After the COVID-19, it was well controlled. There is a stable group in the number of active users. It suggests that epidemic had some whole thing consuming habits of consumers, switching traditional offline shopping to new online shopping. Because during the COVID-19, most of people are forced to stay at home and cooking for their families. They don't go to restaurants, they don't dine outside. So the e-commerce got pushed a lot in during the COVID-19 period. And also the sales of the food was uh, expanded dramatically. According to the data of National Bureau of Statistics, there is a complete constitutional constant increase in online retail combined with this situation with the food market side. It is reasonable to predict in the following several years, there will still be an increasing trend in the sales of online retail. So, as part of uses of Chinese commerce for supporting just to show that, and also as the retailers for high end and medium level consumers, we just build the, the increase of, of the uh, business. Also, because of new change, or oh, getting used to uh, consume uh, ready to eat and ready to cook food, that is a new change we acquired after the COVID-19. Since there were multiple cases that the packages of imported uh, frozen food were detected to be COVID-19 positive, the concerns of consumers regarding raw seafood will not be 
in very short time. As a result, processed products as well as deep processed foods be a new trend of seafood consumption in post epidemic period. Mm, I think the situation will last until the first half of this year, but now the, um, the consumption habit of, of uh, seafood is recovering now. So for frozen seafood, when the epidemic is under well control, consumers could become less sensitive towards imported frozen seafood. According to the real state, the most popular Alaskan product among consumers was called steak. It is a great source for normal meal, diet meals, as well as a complementary food for infants. Uh, also, uh, I listened to Chris' presentation. It is quite popular for younger generation to uh, consume the ready to eat and ready to cook uh, products. So I believe for e-commerce, that is also the trend for future. So that is my simple presentation. Hi, Ricardo. Hello. Hello, Sophia. Hello, I'm here. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Very interesting presentation indeed. We had some small problems regarding your microphone. So if you can adjust the microphone a little bit better uh, yeah. in order for us to make the, the, the questions that we have. So uh -huh. I will start with the question regarding uh, e-commerce, live e-commerce specifically, which is uh, as far as I know, a great trend and you commented about it. So it's a great trend in China. And also the, the usage of WeChat app. So here uh, in South America, we're more used to WhatsApp and WhatsApp. And we don't have the full resources that you have uh, in the chat app. Uh, one of the resources is Lion. Uh, can you comment a little bit about how we chat and this live e-commerce live e uh, performance can help you? Uh, sell more seeds online. Yeah, because you know, in China, almost every consumer is using WeChat. You know, with WeChat, you can set uh, a group with uh, uh, with no more than 500 people. In once you set up this WeChat group, you can have a face-to-face -face interaction with all the consumers. So in this WeChat group, you can have a cooking class, you can have a demos, you can have a presentation, you can have a uh, questionnaire collected, and you can just post the link there, and the consumer in the feature group will click the link and just order and buy immediately if they like the product. So we had uh, quite powerful influential in promoting products and as a very good e-commerce uh, company. So from the consumer side, it doesn't have to uh, go outside of the app. Order to, uh, to ask for food, to, to buy, to pay, and to talk and to learn about how to cook, how uh, yeah, you know yeah. to yeah. to expand the possibilities within uh, seafood. This is very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, so, but, uh, okay. yeah, but also you know, uh, in addition to feature, some um, nowadays O to O is getting popular. That means online and offline. So sometimes, you know, after the communication in WeChat group, you know, they may come out at the weekend. Uh, that's what we have been doing. You know, every week weekend, we invite our customers to our farm and to have some face to face communication. That's great. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Sophia, we have one question from Carolina, and she's asking, what is the biggest, the largest challenge that you have from selling seafood e commerce? And also, what can you tell us about the, the, the most appropriate package for selling and delivering seeds upon online? Uh, uh, for now, because, you know, the package, the simple, the better. Because, you know, for, for, the, um, for the pollution and for the waste, nowadays people in China, they have awareness about the package, you know. They want to reduce the usage of plastic. And uh, so they want to have a real food instead of over packaged food. So if the package is simple and uh, environmental friendly, it will be more uh, popular with Chinese consumers, especially medium and high end consumers.
So they are educated and they have the sense of, uh, I mean, environment protection and sustainable development. So, uh, well, uh, we have to move uh, towards uh, the next presentation, but uh, first, we have quite a question about uh, for explaining about the, the high end consumers and, and their demand for high end products, high end seafood products. But uh, is there a trend uh, uh, for the increase of consumption, of seafood consumption in the middle class? And also, uh, they are using e commerce channels uh, to buy seafood online? Yes. And uh, okay. yes, yeah, uh, it is huge. For example, for high-end families, you know, um, they have a big house and they have their babysitter and their chef maybe, and uh, they can direct, uh, for example, uh, Alaska crab, which is quite expensive, maybe, uh, how to say, 300 bucks for one piece. They may direct at home and prepare by their own chef and the whole salmon. Yeah, so that's the product on platform also. And the uh, lobster, um, from uh, New Zealand and uh, Australia, and of course from the uh, uh, US, yes, we consume a lot of products like that. That's great. Well, uh, if there are any uh, big chat developer hearing us, I kindly ask you to develop a Brazilian version of it, because it would be great to have all these opportunities for us to explore as well. So, uh, well, I can't thank you enough, Sophia, for your time, uh, since it's so late uh, in your hometown. So, uh, well, let's keep in touch. Thank you again. And now, uh, is Carolina around or, or Maleska? Because we're going moving towards the final uh, remarks. Um, hi, Carolina. Bye, hi. Sophia. Thank you. Bye, Sophia. Bye, Sophia. Thank you so much for your participation. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Love you all. Good. Can we switch to Portuguese? Okay. Good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Ooh, the soil. <laughs> wow. So we've been together for almost four hours. So this was our last presentation. We'd like to share this experience of e-commerce in China. And when we think about the, the presentations we had today, as I mentioned at the very beginning, our goal was to inspire you with regard to what's going on in the global seafood market. And we work with Alaska Seafood, so we want to focus on that. But we hope that we have accomplished that goal of inspiring you. you. First of all, I'd like to thank our participants. Our audience was really stable throughout this event. More than 700 people registered for this event. So thank you so much. Housekeeping, this event has been recorded in the different languages. So original audio, Portuguese, English, and Spanish. And we will make this available and uh, seafood, Alaska Seafood and the Seafood Show Latin America YouTube channels. And we also promise we are going to answer all the questions we received. Next, the goal was to share success cases shared by partners or by different companies across the world. So we are available to support to, to share more information about Alaska seafood, seasonality, how we can work together in developing market programs and the regional market. Now, please allow me to share our contact information. I'm going to start with my contact information. So please do take note of my cell phone number, my email, and I have also a same slide for Ricardo. So thank you very much for joining us. 
Ricardo, great. Thank you, Carolina. Well, as a journalist, I took note of everything, but uh, please allow me to summarize the highlights of today's event. Once again, our goal was really to share global experiences that can be replicated or adjusted to Latin American audience, obviously respecting our regional differences, the unique market characteristics. But I think we've learned a great deal. First of all, the role played by industries. Reprocessing hubs, new reprocessing hubs will emerge. Peru is establishing a new one. This is a means to reduce the idleness of uh, this segment and also to uh, make a better use of raw material. I believe that the regional agreements and even if it's temporary, such as the one between Peru and the US for Alaska seafood, I think we really need to explore agreements such as that one. Another important point that was highlighted, quality of raw material, developing other products such as surimi or even a step before fish blocks that are not much used, especially in Brazil, but I do believe that they represent a real opportunity, a means for us to distribute seafood to different parts of the world, not only for Alaska Pollock, but we do have the opportunity for doing that with many other products. E-commerce, Sophia's presentation was excellent in addressing that. Uh, Jerry also addressed that, many others, Galvão from Pão de Açúcar. So what we see is that e-commerce is a trend, worldwide, is a worldwide trend that's here to stay. Imagine to use an app and to receive so much content as Sofia mentioned. And it's also very important that uh, the federal government supports this industry. Guilherme from Noronha, he talked about how the government uh, should support this development. It's useless to have consumers willing to buy a product if you don't have a governmental support, uh, regulations. The government needs to listen to the industry to ensure the safety of this product and also promote uh, industry's development. I am sorry, I think I've spoken a lot, but one more thing that I find key is the new values as Greg, Craig mentioned. New values guiding consumers right now. Sustainability is no longer just a speech, uh, but uh, is a consumer's concern and one of the the consequences of this pandemic is that people are now more concerned about life on this planet, collective lives, and how we can better live together. We are concerned about our families, our colleagues, our friends. This is an online event held this way because of the pandemic. I really wished we could be together in person, exchange business cards, and even exchange some bacteria as you used to. But uh, I hope we have this opportunity and I hope that by October, things are back to normal and that you can attend our trade show and then we we'll discuss issues and generate businesses. So thank you all. It was really a great pleasure to be here. I've learned a great deal. I feel like I had some MBA classes today. That's it, thank you. Well, I think we should give participants a certificate, but I'm kidding. Anyway, thank you so much for this great opportunity. Here you have the contact information for Seafood Show Latin America. It will be a great pleasure to have you here in October. And uh, thank you for giving us this opportunity to work together with ASMI and Seafood Brazil. 
was really a great uh, partnership and we have many ideas to be implemented in the future. And I hope this is not the last, but certainly just the first event of many to come. Thank you all. Thank you, Carolina. Thank you, Ricardo. And uh, all of you who have supported us. Thank you. See you. Well, have a, a great lunch in Brazil, Colombia, Ecuador, Argentina. For those of you who are in South America, well, in Mexico, it's still a bit early, perhaps just a great breakfast. So see you all soon. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you.